Yeah. All right. All right. Hey, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this very special and exciting event. This is something that I personally am very passionate about as far as um, the work of our foundation. So it's really exciting to be offering such a thing to the community. I'm really glad that we're starting to do this kind of programming. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy life to be here with us. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, it looks like I probably know most of you here in the chat, but uh, my name is Gabriel Miguel. I'm the executive director of the Anastasia Foundation. We're working to build the Ringing Sears of Russia movement everywhere in the English speaking world and anywhere where they don't speak English, but we focus on the English language because that's what we speak. So <laughs> we're international. We're doing it as much as we can building and inspiring the Ringing Cedars community. And this event is something very dear to my heart, as I was just saying, uh, birthing man, all about bringing beautiful divine souls into the world from Anastasia's perspective, um, grounding it with medical science from today and the, our present understanding of all these things. So this should be a really fun dive into the subject. I really think it's a first of its kind event in the 16 years that the books have been published so this is kind of a big day and so thank you guys for being here with us so how this event is going to work is emily will be presenting for a while and then after that we will have dedicated q a at the end if you look at the bottom of your screen you will notice that you have a q a button you can submit questions through there as the event progresses it's potential that your question may be addressed as um, Emily is speaking, or it'll probably more than likely just get saved for the Q&A section at the end. So please make sure to submit your questions there so that way they don't get lost in the chat. Um, it'll just make it easier. And yeah, there's also a resources document. Emily was very kind to prepare a document um, referencing with, with all these kinds of references and sources for everything she's gonna be speaking about, um, things that Anastasia said in the books, and that's there in the chat. So you should be able to see that. If you can't see that, um, drop a message in the chat and we will make sure to get that out to you. And yeah, just to, just to preface here before we start. So Emily is gonna be sharing, okay, Evelyn says she can't see anything in the chat. So maybe we can um, resend that one more time. I'm okay. glad I asked. Okay. Yeah, me too. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you guys for, for letting us know. Um, so before we get started, Emily is going to be sharing um, from her experience, from the research that she has done over all this time. But I want to encourage everybody listening now live with us and in the future on, on a recording uh, to please exercise your critical thinking in every single aspect of your life, but especially on the, the topics of birth and how you're choosing to give birth in your family and in your life. You know, Anastasia always, always mentions to use your critical thinking as, as much as possible, plan everything as much as possible, and, you know, do not um, take things by chance, do not do things lightly. And this is, uh, I just want to encourage everybody that, um, you know, do not, we're, we do not promote anybody just trying to go and rush into home birth in an uneducated, unprepared way. We definitely, in, in such an important topic, in such a potentially life-changing or life-threatening topic, uh, if, you, if you don't do it right, um, it's not something to, to joke around with. And so I just want you guys all to remember that as we're getting into it, um, please exercise the greatest care and caution and responsibility in your life. Mm -hmm. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass off the floor to Ariane here, who is our incredible guided imagery expert. We're going to open this event with a bit of a guided imagery uh, exercise here to kind of set the energy and get things going. So Ariane, here you go. I will take myself off of video and, oh, I got to There we go. Get myself out of here. 
Okay, awesome. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take literally two or three minutes here to ground and to create a space of love, exactly how Anastasia talks about a very receptive, open, uplifting, heartfelt space. So we're going to do that with a little bit of guided imagery. So I'm going to invite you all to make yourself comfortable wherever you're sitting. And you're going to close your eyes. And take a very deep breath. You're breathing through the nose here, a very full and complete breath. And we're going to do that again together. A very full and complete breath. And this is a unified breath here. So we're all breathing together. We're breathing together here on this call. And we're breathing together with all of the people who are watching this call after the recording. So we're breathing in this sense of community, of support. You feel all of this breath around you, all of these kindred spirits around you, supporting you with their breath you supporting them with yours. Take a full inhale. And we're gonna connect with our ringing seer's roots here. This is an image that we use frequently in our community calls, a root system in the ground. You're rooting and grounding down, downwards right into the earth. And as you do, you're connecting with the root systems of the ringing cedars, readers, and community members that live next to you. Those that are on this call. Grounded, rooted, stabilized. Again, let's take a deep breath together. Let's take a moment and connect with our heart here. We're connecting with this incredible sense of community, of love, of support all over the globe. Kindred spirits who all share the same vision, the vision of a pristine, beautiful, pure planet and life. And again, we breathe together, unified breath. Our hearts are open. We're creating a very loving and safe space of love between all of us here on this call. Let's take one last round of breath here to anchor this softness, this lightness, this incredible global connection Perfect. And whenever you're ready, you can slowly open your eyes. Awesome. Arianne, thank you love. so much. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you again for joining us. I hope that you feel the, the power and support of all the Runic Cedars readers all over, all over this beautiful planet. So we are going to let Emily take the floor now and, and get started. And so uh, if you guys have any questions, remember to submit them in the Q&A section. We'll get to them when we can. And yeah, let's get started. 
great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to add to what Gabriel said before about, you know, doing your own research and your own critical thinking. Um, that's, I mean, that's essentially, that's what set me on this path as I kind of set out to answer my own questions when I was thinking about getting pregnant. And this is some of the information I've come across since then. Um, I'm not a midwife or a doctor. I'm not in a position to give anyone advice about their specific situation. So uh, yeah, we need to make sure when we do something like a home birth, um, we do it in a way that's very educated and you know, we make plans for when things don't go exactly as we want them to, right? So um, I'm just gonna start with kind of a theme underlying the um, spiel that will follow is the fact that um, humans are, are mammals and they give birth in a way that all of the other mammals do. Um, we need privacy in order to give birth in a way that is without complication and smooth. Um, we need the chance to self-direct our birth. You know, having someone coach us to do this, do that is not, um, is not conducive to, to good outcomes. And also that birth, <clears throat> um, this is not what you hear in the medical model, but birth doesn't really need to be helped. It, there's no extra work that needs to be done by the woman. Birth is spontaneous and involuntary and our bodies will do it perfectly almost every time. Of course, we need to you know, use planning and discernment um, just in case it doesn't. But um, I'm going to start by telling my birth story and then we'll get into um, talking about a home birth and hospital birth and some of the biological and spiritual mechanisms behind birth, um, including what Anastasia has said about it. So, um, so before I get into the birth, I want to point out that um, finding a home birth midwife is not always easy to do, especially back when I first started looking. I was still using Google back then, silly me. Hey, Google search does not turn up home birth midwives in your area. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so if you... Um, find a midwives association in your state or province if you're outside of the US um, and contact them, that is a good place to start. So like I found the Iowa Midwives Association because I live in the state of Iowa and told them what I was looking for and a midwife emailed me back. So um, just a, a little hint. <laughs> so I knew I wanted a home birth or I suspected I did um, and I, I hadn't yet read the Ringing Cedars series um, when I got pregnant or not until after my son was born did I, did I read the, the Ringing Cedars series, but I knew I wanted a home birth because of other things I had read. I knew it was the safest way to let the birth happen in a, away from any intervention, unnecessary intervention that would be harmful to me or my baby. So um, when I first brought it up to my partner, he wasn't 100% on it. And a lot of women run into this, that they want a home birth, but um, the support isn't there either from their family or their partner. And he was open to it, but he was just kind of like, you know, I mean, it would be fine, but we can just go to the hospital and just tell them we want this, we don't want that, you know? And so... Um, so after that conversation, I took a little time to research a little more. And um, at that time, I was already pregnant. And I went back like a few weeks later with a plan to pay for the midwife because insurance doesn't cover home birth midwives. <laughs> and um, I could articulate a little better why I wanted the home birth. And then he was behind me 100% once I, once I was a little more informed and, uh, and knew why I wanted that. So um, anyway, um, I had a lovely pregnancy. I went to prenatal appointments once a month with my midwives at her house. It was, she lived about an hour away. And um, when I was 
about, I was nine days past my due date. So I was 41 weeks and a couple days. And I just kind of felt like, you know, it's, I feel like it's time for this baby to come. And I had heard that if you drink some castor oil, which is a laxative, it could induce labor. So I did that. I drank two tablespoons of castor oil. And um, I kind of thought I did it at night. I thought I would get a good night's sleep and maybe in the morning my labor would start. But instead, my water broke at 11 p.m. <laughs> Whoops. And so, and labor started up right away. It worked like a charm. And um, so anyway, I, I labored all night. Um, it was not painful. And again, I had not read the Ringing Cedar series, but I had done enough research. I knew it didn't have to be painful. And, um, and it wasn't at that time. So I labored all night um, and things were going great. But then um, kind of in, later on in the morning, late morning, the next day, you know, I'm still laboring, but, um, I started getting really sleepy, very relaxed. I started taking naps in between contractions and my labor kind of slowed down. Later, I found out that this is very normal for that to happen. Um, and just a, a natural part of pregnancy, but at the time it made me a little nervous because, um, my water had already broken. So my midwives, uh, wanted me to give birth within 48 hours of my water breaking because they say it's a risk of infection if um, if your water goes if you're if you go too long without giving birth after your water breaks. Later, I found out that well, I knew your bag of waters would refill um, if they break. Later, I found out that your bag of water actually can reseal too. Like if your water breaks, it can even reseal and you know you can go on for several more days I did not know that at the time so I was a little nervous <laughs> and I also learned that infection is very unlikely to happen when you're at home it's much more likely in the hospital that you would get an infection but um my midwives were like you know labor's slowing down it's fine uh take some more castor oil take a nap eat some lunch call us when your labor starts up again and they left um because midwives know going back to that thing about privacy, about mammals wanting privacy to give birth. Midwives know that um, once they show up to a birth, a woman's labor often kind of stalls or slows down because um, the woman then feels observed or watched. So, so they said, go take a nap, you know, just you and Joe take some time together. And they, they left. They said, call us when labor starts up again. And um, so I did what they said. And it worked perfectly. I, um, you know, labor started coming on uh, really intense after I had a nap and, you know, got some rest. And um, <clears throat> that time that Joe and I had alone together really was the most fun I had during the whole labor. Like, I understand the, the attraction of a, an unassisted birth, having that experience, because you know, with the midwives there, especially because we have a, a small space. It was a small space to birth in. There was a lot of people kind of crowded in and um, it was just fun. You know, we, you know, we smooched and cuddled and we talked about our baby and it, we laughed. And I mean, it was, it was really a beautiful bonding experience. It was our last bonding experience, you know, before our son was born. So it was really great. And, um, and he was fantastic. He just brought me water throughout my labor and, or, um, you know, I asked if I asked for food once in a while, he brought me food. He was fantastic. And, um, and then finally I was feeling like, you know, like I was going to need to start pushing. Like I was getting that kind of feeling that pressure. And, um, so, and I remember saying to, to Joe during that time, I was like, this baby needs to come out tonight. I cannot do this for another night, <laughs> which I later learned that when a woman is uh, cervix is very close to full dilation, she gets a shot of hormones that often make her say things like, I can't do it or I'm going to die. Um, and a lot of times she doesn't even remember saying that. It's just, um, 
you know, it's all about hormones, the, the pregnancy or the, the childbirth process is very much directed by hormones. And, um, but anyway, we called the midwives. They were there in 10 minutes and, um, she, my midwife saw, I was laboring over this Chuck's pad and it had some blood on it. She goes, Oh, that looks like your eight centimeter blood. Let's, you know, get you in the birthing pool. So we filled up the, the tub because I was planning to give birth in the water and got in and started pushing. I pushed for an hour and 15 minutes. And uh, later I found out that really I did not have to push that much. I'll talk more about pushing later. But um, then, um, and I just want to tell you about this really memorable moment I had um, when I was giving birth to my son. Um, when finally I delivered his head, um, you know, I, I was in the water and I looked down and I could see his face, his, you know, his eyes were still closed. He looked like he was just sleeping, but I, I could see his face and his body was still on the inside. And, you know, that was the first time I ever saw his face. And um, I mean, it was, it was wild that, that moment, um, you know, and then, um, then I delivered his body into Joe's hands, Joe caught him. And then we, you know, he was up above the water. He didn't cry. He just coughed a couple times and, um, just looked at us wide-eyed. I have a, I have a picture. Oops. Participant screen sharing is disabled. I'll show it later. Emily, you need help with the screen share? Yeah, the screen, it says host disabled participant screen share. Ah, uh, here you go. Try that. Okay. Oh, yep. I see it now. Technical, technical things, guys. We're real professional here. Oh, yeah. Can you see my... Power we see it. Okay. Well, here's my picture. Um... That's just after he, he was born, you know, just looking at us, not crying, but a little wide eyed, like, look, maybe a little nervous, maybe because of the, I later learned from Anastasia, you know, the midwives in the room, like having other people's energies besides the parents can make the child a little anxious. So maybe that was it, but um, just a really beautiful moment and a beautiful bonding experience. Um, so, I mean, the birth went perfectly, um, he breastfed all night. That's been, and you know, it was a beautiful experience. So, um, so that's my story. And, um, a lot of people are wondering if, if you know someone who's given birth at home, like it, a lot of people are like, they don't think it could possibly be that good, <laughs> you know? Um, but I mean, it really was wonderful. Like it was the best experience of my life. And, um, and that kind of leads into people thinking, well, is home birth safe? Is it safe for everyone? And I'm going to qualify that before we answer the question is home birth safe. I'm going to ask the question is hospital birth safe. Okay. Um, Great question. question. Thank you. <laughs> it's a question that we don't usually ask that needs to be asked. So um, I'll just tell you, if I would have given birth at the hospital, I wouldn't have been allowed to eat or drink. I would have been forced to wear an IV and a fetal monitor, which restricts your movement. Um, and I would have had cervical checks every single hour. So people sticking their hands up me every hour. I mean, that's, it's not, not pleasant. It's not great for the, you know, the feel good hormones that are supposed to be happening during birth. And um, I did have a kind of a longer labor. It was like 23 hours after my water broke that my son was finally born. Um, so they definitely would have wanted to give me Pitocin, which is a synthetic oxytocin. It's a drug that causes um, uterine contractions to accelerate the delivery. Um, it causes abnormally intense contractions without any breaks in between like natural contractions. And it definitely increases the risk of other interventions happening and causes distress in the baby. So, you know, all that stuff combined, like not eating, um, having this 
drug in my body um, to make the contractions more intense. When I did start pushing, like I know I would have been weak because I wouldn't have had any rest either because they would have given me drugs to keep the labor going instead of letting me take a nap, right? Um, and um, during my birth also, I didn't include this, but when I was pushing, I did have a little bit of, I did start bleeding a little bit and my midwives weren't super alarmed, but they did check the baby's vitals to make sure he was okay. At the hospital, I mean, that might've just straight up in a C-section, like, oh, she's bleeding. She's going to start hemorrhaging. We need to, you know, stop pushing. We have to do a C-section. And, um, or I might've ended up with some other intervention because I couldn't push the baby out like a vacuum assisted delivery or, or something like this. Um, and also not just that, but, you know, being at the hospital, I know I would have been like had a kind of a high alert feeling like making sure they don't cut the cord too early or like they don't do anything to the baby that I don't want them to do. And um, of course, any kind of stress as we'll cover later is, um, is going to stall labor. Um, it's, it's not good for a laboring mother to feel that kind of high alert feeling. So um, having said that, let's look at some numbers I'm going to share my share PowerPoint again. Okay, I'm not sure what this um, looks like from your side. Maybe I can. Exactly as it is on your screen is, okay. is how we okay. see it. I'm going to um, make it a little start. larger, full screen. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Okay, here we go. That was a beautiful story, by the way, Emily. There's a lot of people, uh, there was a few people in the in the comments uh, who said your, your baby was beautiful. And oh, oh thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I should have said his name is Jack. He's two years old now. <laughs> um, but he's, and actually it's so interesting, Gabriel, because Joe pointed this out to me, the title of this, um, this call birthing man, you know, the name Jack means man. <laughs> wow. Birthing man. Yeah. <laughs> so, little synchronicity there. <laughs> That's incredible. That's yeah, perfect. That's perfect. perfect. So, um, so looking at comparing outcomes here, this is these are statistics for the USA. So, looking at hospital birth um, in 2019, according to the CDC, the C-section rate uh, um, in the U.S. national as a whole was 31.7 percent. So that's almost a third of births that end in a C-section, which is astronomical. <laughs> I, and, and, and if I just wanted to interject here that I, I, a lot of those, you know, you could debate on how, quote, necessary is a C-section, but mm -hmm. a lot of those are entirely just crazily unnecessarily like done. Yes. And not only that, but something I mentioned, and I'll talk about that in a second too, but when you go to the hospital, which the ho going to the hospital is the first intervention. We don't go to the hospital if we're not ill or if there's no emergency, right? So I, going to the hospital is the first intervention. And then when you're there, you receive a lot of other interventions and each one makes um, the next intervention exponentially more likely to happen. So if you go there and get an epidural, like you are already so much more likely to end in a C-section because you've disrupted the natural balance of hormones in the woman's body. You've disrupted the, the process that um, is supposed to bring the baby here. So um, it's the hospital, it seems to be a game of catch up and you know, they, they either they induce labor with Pitocin and, um, you know, and then they give you this drug and that and, uh, and then, you know, and finally it ends in a, in a C-section and they say, oh, well, good thing we were here to give you a C-section when it was their interventions that, that made it necessary. So uh, it's, it's a really sad situation. And this rate does include scheduled C-sections as well. Um, some women elect to have a C-section. Um, I believe that if there was true informed consent, women would not choose it, but um, you know, hospitals are a business and they get a lot of money for C-sections. So, you know, that's, um, that's the, that's the world we live in at the moment. 
<laughs> As one of the chatters just said, Evelyn just said, all ways for them to make more money and charge more fees. Yes, absolutely. And you know, if you call a hospital and ask them, how much money does it cost to have a baby? They can't tell you <laughs> because um, they expect that they will intervene on your birth enough times that they can't um, they can't predict um, what it will be. You know, they they just it's just expected that it's not going to happen uh, in a, in a naturally. So um, so C section rate thirty one point seven percent, and I mean getting a C section is it just increases the mortality for the mother especially but the baby too so much i i'm sorry i don't have the numbers right here for how much it increases maternal mortality to have a c section but um you know in my mind that is like a c section is complete last resort um because it's a very major surgery and a, a really dangerous intervention. Um, and just, yeah, 31.7%. So, okay, anyway, let's go on to the next one. Exclusive breastfeeding, EBF is exclusive breastfeeding through six months. Only 25.6% of women, um, that's an average in the whole US. Um, and that, is, that isn't just for hospital births, that is, you know, all women who were part of this survey. And uh, that's abysmally low. <laughs> I mean, we know from Anastasia how important it is to breastfeed. We know it's our baby's natural food. It's, it's nutrition. It communicates knowledge of our pristine origins. And all of the, you know, the interventions during birth have um, make it make breastfeeding harder and interfere with the breastfeeding relationship. That's according to La Leche League. They said the number one reason for breastfeeding difficulty is, is interventions during birth and having a birth that is as natural as possible is the best way to ensure positive breastfeeding. Interesting. So I'm sorry to interject here. It's just that, it, it, so the breastfeeding could go down, not just because a mother is making the choice not to breastfeed, but it's because they become incapable. Um, maybe not. Uh, okay, so there are a few, there are a lot of factors. So um, the drugs that women get in a hospital for um, like epidurals, especially, are going, they affect the baby as well, that those drugs are shared with the baby. And um, so when the baby is born, they're, um, the hormones that are supposed to be like going on in the baby that, that, um, make it want to latch and feed are not there. Um, so the baby might not have any interest in breastfeeding, even though that should be the first thing he or she does. Or uh, maybe the latch is weak or um, painful um, for the mother. And especially in a C-section, the baby, because the baby hasn't gone through the process of birth, it's, well, in my mind, it's, uh, you're, you're ripping a baby out of the womb before he's ready to be born, um, he's like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, like what? <laughs> and um, Janice Marcello is a really good researcher who I'll talk more on later, but- she, I interviewed her before on our podcast. Oh, you have? Oh, yeah. she's fantastic. She's we how did a I birth about interview. the series. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, cool, cool. She did an amazing book for those who are interested called The Dark Side of Pre Prenatal uh, Healthcare or something. You should check out her books. Very good books. Yeah, I have not read them, but um, I she's fantastic. Um, thank you for for. She's a Ringing out. Cedars reader. She is. Um, I learned about the series through her because I was researching for my own birth, and she gave an example of Anastasia. She said, um, you know gave Anastasia as an example of what a human could be without all of the agendas in place to diminish humans. And I thought, oh, that sounds like a good series. Um, I didn't get around to reading it until uh, maybe a year later, but, <laughs> but um, that's how I learned about the series, yeah. So um, anyway, uh, and especially if, you know, a C-section really interferes with the breastfeeding relationship and often makes it painful, like, because the baby is not, um, 
their latch is not good. Like uh, breastfeeding is not supposed to hurt, but women who have um, interventions during birth often report, you know, breastfeeding is painful. They need to use a nipple guard or whatever. I have a, a friend who recently had a hospital birth and ended up with a C-section because of interventions that happened during her birth and breastfeeding has been very painful for her. So that's part of a lot. The reason for failure to breastfeed is a woman finds it to be painful and, you know, she's like throws up her hands and uses formula instead because babies breastfeed a lot (laughs) when they're, when they're first born. So, yeah. So interventions are the number one cause of failure to breastfeed. Um, So um, onto maternal mortality. So you see 23.8 deaths per 100,000 live births and for infant mortality, 558.3 deaths per 100,000 live births. And I do wanna point out that a mother giving birth in a hospital in the US is 10 times more likely to die than a mother giving birth in Greece, Estonia, or Singapore. (laughs) So the US has horrible maternal mortality rates in comparison to the rest of the developed world. And um, places in the world that embrace natural birth have much better outcomes. Um, So so that's where we are for for hospital birth. I wanna point out that um, going to a hospital birth, some women are successful having a drug-free birth at the hospital, this is true. Um, But going to a hospital is, you know, you're being overseen usually by a doctor and doctors are not trained in natural birth. They're trained in intervention. You know, they're, this is um, what you look for. And this is the drug you give for this problem happening during birth. And, um, you know, this is how you do a (laughs) C-section. So it's, it's not a great place to position yourself to have a natural birth. And because I didn't give birth in a hospital, I can't say by personal experience, but from what I've heard, uh, other women have said that they kind of are peddling epidurals. They're like, Hey, ready for that epidural yet? You know, and a woman is laboring and she's, maybe she's in pain. Um, you know, maybe she's not, but a lot of times women we'll get to that later are feeling pain during birth and, um, it can be hard to say no, even if you, even if you don't want it to begin with. So, um, <clears throat> okay. Second, uh, so let's look at the other column now, the home birth side. So the C-section rate is 3.7%. This is according to the British medical journal. It was, there was a study in 2005 using, uh, 5,418, I think, um, home birth planned home births. And this is the data that came out of it. 3.7% C-section rate, much better. Um, exclusive breastfeeding through six months. They did not have breastfeeding data on that, um, on that study. So I talked to my midwife (laughs) and asked her what the breastfeeding rate was, uh, among the moms that she helps for home births. And she said that in 2021, they had a 98% exclusive breastfeeding rate um, because they had one single mother who did not have enough glandular tissue. That, that's a birth defect. So it'd be rare for that to happen. And she did feed at the breast, but um, supplemented with formula. So, I mean, that's a very good, <laughs> that's a very good breastfeeding rate, but it is important to note, you know, when comparing these that not everyone who gives birth in a hospital wants to breastfeed. You know, some women know they're gonna use formula, whereas women who give birth at home are at least going to try, you know, like usually that's important to a woman who's giving birth at home. So, you know, it's not an exact comparison, but it gives us an idea. Um, Zero mothers died and the um, infant mortality, I converted it to be per, 100,000 to line up um, is you're um, more than three times, the infant is more than three times more likely to die in a hospital than at home. So these are um, 
these are the outcomes comparison. That's astounding. It is, it is striking, yes. And, um, and when I gave birth at home, like there were some women who said to me, like, you know, I think that's, that's great that you're doing that, but I wouldn't want to do that in case something went wrong <laughs> or like, you know, you're so brave for doing that. I'm like, do you know, do you know that all the risks of going to the hospital, <laughs> you know, it, it, that feels a lot more risky. And that is what could go wrong is the, the interventions that you're subject to at the hospital. So. Right. That seems to be the the sentiment among a lot of women who are unaware of the the true facts behind of home birth is they think that it it is a dangerous thing to be partaking in and that you know you're taking a big risk, right? Yeah, yeah. That's but it's it's not it's not so at all. That's not so at all. All right. Um oh shoot. Okay, I need to get back to my, okay. So um, now that we talked about that, I do just wanna go through a couple of really common hospital interventions and talk about how it disrupts the, the natural birth process. So um, for example, an epidural is a very common intervention in a hospital. So when a mother gets an epidural, she no longer feels the sensations of birth. If the epidural worked, <laughs> she doesn't anyway. Um, she can't move on her own. Um, she needs the nurses to, you know, to move her and help her like lay on her side in bed. And um, movement is like such an important part of helping a baby get into the right positioning because babies are so intelligent. They know exactly what they need to do and they help the mother birth them they do and um if you know for them to get in the right position they need the mother to take the intuitive cues they're sending um you know when i was giving birth i remember like just i would just i didn't know i couldn't articulate why i was doing it but i just was get, getting down on all fours and like shaking myself from side to side I, I had no idea why I was doing it. I just did it. You know, you just, you do what's asked of you during the birth. And um, when you can't move, that's going to disrupt a lot of what the baby is trying to do. Um, <clears throat> what's more, the mother is no longer secreting the hormones that protect the baby from distress during the contractions. Um, in, the, in the books, we know that the, you know, mothers of the vidrus would these Vidrus period would talk to their babies, communicate with them during the, the labor, you know, they were not fearful, they, you know, told them what was happening and the baby kind of interpreted the, the contractions as caresses, you know, instead of um, being fearful of them. But mothers, a lot of times start out fearful anyway, especially if they're getting an epidural that kind of shows that they're fearful of the sensations of birth. And, um, and then the mother's no longer secreting and sharing hormones um, with the baby that's protecting it because the mother can't feel the sensation. So the body stops <laughs> making those hormones. And so that often cause, causes distress to the baby, which later could lead to a C-section, you know? Um, and yeah, so all, all of those often stall labor after a woman gets an epidural, which causes the next intervention usually is Pitocin to get labor going again. So Pitocin is um, synthetic oxytocin. Uh, oxytocin is the hormone that moves labor along in a woman. Um, and it, so they use Pitocin to induce or accelerate labor at hospitals. Um, so Pitocin causes contractions that are more intense than natural contractions with no breaks in between natural contractions have breaks because the mother needs a break. The baby needs a break. You know, we can't just go at a hundred percent the whole time until the baby comes out. So this causes fatigue and distress and usually pain, um, in the mother and in the baby. So, um, and again, it reduces the mother's secretion of hormones that she's supposed to have the natural oxytocin, which means her body is no longer doing the childbirth on its own, 
which means she needs more and more Pitocin <laughs> to keep the labor going. And, um, you know, so that's obviously not good. It just leads to um, more and more of the, the side effects that we've talked about, more and more distress. And um, not only that, but natural oxytocin, the hormone oxytocin is, it's the love hormone. And we get a shot of oxytocin. We're supposed to get a shot of oxytocin when the baby emerges that bonds us with the baby. Um, so having the Pitocin interferes with that bonding. The mother doesn't get the shot of oxytocin when the baby is born and she is not bonded to that baby as strongly as she would have been in a natural birth. It also interferes with breastfeeding because breastfeeding is also directed with oxytocin. Um, so that's how Pitocin is, um, messes up the, the breastfeeding relationship. Um, and then we've already talked about how hospitals <laughs> seek profit and, um, you know, it's a, it is a tool of the technocracy to, um, to sever families. And that sounds really harsh. I mean, my, my mom works as a nurse in the labor and delivery unit of a hospital. She's not purposely hurting anyone, but her training, I believe, is not um, beneficial to the mothers and babies who are, you know, who are coming in. These people aren't, I mean, necessarily evil, but their, um, their training is, you know, what they're trained to do, what they think they're supposed to do to, to help mothers is, is not beneficial most of the time. <clears throat> and um, also in the hospital, this is the last kind of point I'm going to make about hospital birth. Um, and this is something that I heard from Janice Barcello. Her website is on the resources page, birthofanewearth.com. And uh, she says that parents often allow their babies to be traumatized because of the trauma that they themselves experienced during birth. Um, and so, you know, healing ourselves is a big part of getting, setting this straight for the future. And I also, something else she pointed out is that the basic practices of the hospital interfere with bonding, um, not just with what I described with the Pitocin, but also something simple like um, putting, you know, the newborn hats that they put on the baby's head. When the baby is born, um, you know, sight, smell, um, sound are all part of imprinting, um, both for mother and baby. And when you put a hat on the baby's head, the, the forehead is a hot spot for pheromones. You know, that's that, I mean, that baby's head is the most beautiful smell that <laughs> the mother will ever smell. But if you put a babe, a hat on the baby's head, then she's not going to get the, the full impact of the, the baby's pheromones. And that interferes with her bonding with, with that child. And um, other practices like the eye ointment they put on the baby's eyes um, I, you know, not something I would put on my baby's eyes. They say it's keeps them from going blind, but the eye ointment temporarily blinds the child. So, or blurs their vision at least. So, you know, they can't see their mother's face clearly. Um, and the imprinting again is, um, interfered with. And then also, you know, they'll often take the baby to weigh it or do this or that before the breastfeeding has happened. And that permanently disrupts the breastfeeding relationship. So, um, so a lot of the just routine practices of a hospital are, um, are interfering with family bonding and with newborns fully being a part of our families. Okay, so um, now we've talked about the home birth and hospital birth data and compared them. Um, so for a home birth, um, some women choose to have an unassisted birth. Some women choose to have birth with a midwife and neither one is right or wrong. It's, you know, every person is different and what people are comfortable with is different. 
Um, I had midwives at my birth. I loved them. I will use them again. Um, and I just want to talk about some of the things that a midwife can bring to the table in a home birth um, if you've never had one. So um, I'm talking here about certified professional midwives, CPMs. These midwives are apprenticeship trained for home birth specifically. That's different than a CNM, that's a certified nurse midwife who works in a hospital and um, their goal is to help women have a more natural birth in a hospital setting. Okay, so I'm talking about CPMs. So um, these midwives um, bring some equipment and skills in case of an emergency. Um, they do bring an oxygen mask and tank um, in case maybe the baby's lungs aren't developed enough, you know, baby isn't breathing well or regularly when they're born. Um, or, and they also bring Pitocin, that horrible drug I talked about, just in case of a hemorrhage, because if a woman is um, hemorrhaging, you know, she's bleeding and won't stop bleeding, the Pitocin will stop the hemorrhaging. So they bring that in case of that rare emergency. That's extremely rare in a home birth. My midwife said she's never, ever had to use it. They also bring um, the skill of neonatal resuscitation. Um, this is something, it's not the same as infant CPR. There are no chest compressions. So it's really important it, to take a class if you want to be able to do this effectively. Um, so in neonatal resuscitation, uh, you just, you know, it involves breath into the baby's mouth. And the amazing thing about a baby and about this just perfect design, like, I mean, I remember when I learned this, I thought like, I just felt so divine, like all of this is such a divine plan. So when your baby is born, they are attached to the umbilical cord, which is attached to the placenta, attached to the uterine lining of the mother. Okay, so if the baby is born and they're not breathing right away, that baby is still getting oxygenated blood pumping throughout the body through the cord. So that makes breath less necessary than it would be, you know, without the oxygenated blood. And Ina Mae Gaskin is a really famous um, midwife here in the States. That's Ina Mae Gaskin. She wrote the book, Spiritual Midwifery, which I highly recommend. Um, but she's reported successful resuscitation after 45 minutes with no brain damage <laughs> because the baby, you know, the cord was still attached. The cord was not cut too early. <laughs> So the cord needs to be intact. You know, the placenta is still attached to the mother and the baby's still getting oxygen that way. And, um, and that buys everyone time to help the baby breathe. So it's just a beautiful design. Um, midwives also bring knowledge of some red, red flags and what the real emergencies are and what to do in that case. And um, not only that, but um, we learned in book uh, 8.1, I think it was, um, that, no, 8.2, that in Veed Roos birth, the, the midwives would stand just outside the kin's domain. And mostly they were there to put the parents at ease. <laughs> you know, the parents, you know, the midwife was rarely needed, but the parents knew that she was there in case of an abnor abnormality and they just felt better having her there. So, um, so midwives are great, but you know, if you're truly educated, you can have a safe unassisted birth. Um, you just have to have a plan, you know, so, um, that is up to every person to decide for themselves on this question of whether home birth is safe. Um, midwives are also trained to determine who is a good candidate for home birth, um, CPMs are the only ones trained. So don't go to the hospital or the OBGYN and ask the doctor if you're a good candidate for home birth. <laughs> they, that's not going to work. <laughs> but the, I'm, I have a list of kind of contraindications of home birth I'm going to share with you here. Okay. 
Um, no, we'll just, okay. Okay. So here are some contraindications. You might want to consider giving birth at a hospital if any of these things apply to you. So we have diabetes, chronic high blood pressure during pregnancy, baby not in ideal position. Um, and uh, some of these I'm going to talk, you know, talk a little bit on. Um, as for a baby not being in the ideal position, um, there are people successfully spin their babies all the time. There's a great resource called spinningbabies.com. Um, I have a friend who used it to help her baby get into the right position. And, uh, you know, so midwives or, you know, if you're doing an unassisted birth, there are ways you, you can feel the positioning of your own baby too, but it's good to know what position your baby is in and, um, you know, take steps to do that. The transverse or shoulder presenting, you're, you cannot give birth in that position. It won't work. However, some women have given birth in breech position, um, but an Ina May Gaskin, that midwife I told you about, has said that breech birth is just another variation of normal. However, um, it should be paired with a strong desire to birth vaginally and in breech position because there is more risk associated with birthing a baby in breech. And I do not recommend birthing breech except like I, you need to be, not need to, need to. Um, I recommend doing so in the presence of someone who is trained in breech birth because unfortunately um, it's very hard to find professionals who are trained in breech birth these days. Um, it's become so uncommon um, because of C-sections because, and just, you know, cut you open and take the baby out. And um, so, I mean, it's really unfortunate, but, you know, most doctor, I, I mean, you, it'd be hard to find a doctor who's trained in breech birth and many midwives are not trained in breech birth. So, um, you know, you should definitely do your own research about that if that is a position you're in, but um, but babies can be born in breach safely. You should do it with someone who's trained to, to help you do it safely. Um, <clears throat> premature labor is another item on this list. Um, and again, I'm going to qualify this, do your own research about it, because um, this is something I heard Janice Barcelo talking about. Um, the babies who end up in the, NI, the NICU um, because they're premature, I don't want to use the word torture. They're subject to very distressing situations. Um, being separated from their mother, I think, is probably the absolute worst, most horrible thing that could happen to a newborn. And my heart goes out to those babies. Um, so there's that. Um, they have like, you know, feeding tube and like tape on their bodies that the tape gets pulled off so they can change the, you know, just like ripping tape off their really sensitive skin. Um, they're put under incubators that often burn them. A lot of times the incubators burn them and um, it's, it's very distressing for the babies. So um, I'm going to add to that, that um, there was a group of researchers who um, developed um, system of care called kangaroo care and there's also another like partner kit called kangaroo mother care and they developed this and brought it to a remote place in Africa and their goal was to try to improve the survival rate of premature babies in that region by teaching this method kangaroo care and what kangaroo care is essentially is using the mother as an incubator it keeps the baby against the mother's skin and the mother incubates the baby um, rather than a machine at the hospital. And you know what these researchers found is that they, they got better outcomes, better survival rates than hospitals in the US using kangaroo care and using the mother as an incubator. How many hospitals do you think got rid of their incubators and told the mothers that they should incubate their own children? <laughs> you know, 
it doesn't happen that way. So um, if it might, like for you, it might depend on how premature the baby is, you know, um, because I mean, of course that, that would feed into it, but um, you know, that's a decision you would have to make for yourself where you would want to birth a premature baby and what condition, knowing what conditions they might be subject to at the, at the hospital. I'm sure the hospital has probably saved the life of many premature babies. So again, that's, that's going to be up to you. Um, overdue labor is the next item. And like I told you from my story, there are ways to induce labor at home. Um, there's on the resources page, evidence-based birth has some really good resources on that. I attempt, attended a webinar through EBB that um, had went through some different ways to induce labor at home. So, um, you know, it doesn't have to go too far overdue, but I've also heard of perfectly healthy babies being born at 43 weeks and more. So uh, next uh, item. Oh. Emily, real quick, can you, what is the EBB website? Oh, evidence, evidencebasedbirth.com. And it's on the resources sheet that I put in the chat. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, poor general health, malnutrition, severe anemia, lack of vitality, and toxemia. This list was back in the day. The new word for toxemia is preeclampsia symptoms. And the last item on the list, and this is this list is from Ina May Gaskin's book, Spiritual Midwifery, was is strong fear and or mistrust of birth as a natural process. So we know that trusting our bodies and um, you know, giving birth without fear is one thing that will help make our home birth successful, along with, you know, being educated. Okay. <clears throat> Powerful information, very informative. I'm not sure if you're seeing the comments here. There's a lot of- I have not been looking at all. <laughs> yeah, so. there's a lot of encouraging things and um, people sharing their stories, oh, uh, like all kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> Rhea says, the doctors laughed at me when I told them I was going to have my baby naturally. So I went to the midwives and I eventually had an unassisted birth successfully. Um, all all kinds of things here so anyway a lot of activity in the comments thank you for mentioning that and there is it's so sad women say they want a natural birth and they do get laughed at not just by doctors but other women will say oh that's that's what you say yeah that's not going to happen <laughs> you know and i've i've talked to many women who have shared the same story that like, why do I get ridiculed for, for wanting a drug-free birth? You know, why don't other women want me to do that? Um, and it's very sad. And, and I, I experienced that too. I, you know, was planning this home birth and I shared that my mom is a nurse in a hospital, you know, uh, in the labor and delivery unit. And, um, you know, I, so I said, you know, more than once, you know, yeah, I'm no drugs. I don't want any of that stuff. And my mom, well, that's what you say now, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> right. Wait until you're in unimaginable pain and you, yeah. Are, yeah, right. Right. Exactly. And, um, it's, you know, that's why a community like this is so important where we can support each other because it's, um, I mean, it's, it's a nasty, it's a nasty world out there. Sometimes it, it doesn't have to be, but, um, you know, women experience a lot of ridicule wanting their natural birth and, and it's very sad. And Good also point. things like wanting to, to take the placenta home, they get ridiculed for, you know, wanting to do something with the placenta. And I had a friend who was told by the hospital that she's not allowed to take her placenta home. <laughs> and I, I said, they own your placenta after your baby. What? <laughs> I mean, just ridiculous, ridiculous. To that point, uh, the 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 I know that the 
the hospitals generally keep a portion of um, some of the birth material in order to lay claim to the child through the yes. birth certificate, yes. um, which is a whole nother rabbit hole for people. Yeah. But that's a that's a real thing. Um, and you can actually reclaim the birth matter of yourself or your child and, um, you know, do some things there legally to get yourself out of that system. But then Ma Maureen in the comments says, I really wanted a home birth, but there was absolutely no support at the time in my area. So glad you're speaking up. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sorry you didn't get your home birth, but I, I'm, yeah, this is what it's all about is just, um, making it easier for women. I've talked to, yeah, a lot of women who my, a friend of mine, a dear friend, uh, has a nine month old son and she wants a home birth badly for her, her next baby. And there's no support and she's doesn't want to rock the boat that much, <laughs> but, um, well, since we're on the topic, uh, maybe a word of advice, something I did to help get a little bit of support, like from my mom who, was really against the home birth thing. I brought her my midwife's resume and I said, you know, these are her qualifications. She's been practicing for 20 years. A mother has never died. A baby has never died. Um, and I brought her to one of my prenatal appointments. You know, she got to talk to them and ask them questions and, um, you know, bringing them into it, you know, might help, but, uh, it's, it is, it's something that I think is becoming more common now after some of the really cruel things that were happening during um, COVID policy, things like taking babies away from mothers um, and, you know, making mothers wear masks during, during their labor. I, I mean, just horrible, horrible things. Um, I think home birth has gained strides because of that. And I think it's, you know, it's just going to keep going up and up and up. <laughs> so. Um, that was one thing I wanted to mention was that I, I know a woman who she's on YouTube. They have a YouTube channel called uh, like Jake and um, Nicole's homestead. And uh, they, they had a homestead in Vancouver or outside of Vancouver. And they were building this beautiful little place there wanted to give birth at home for some reason they couldn't and she nicole had to give birth in a hospital and during the birth um because it's covid time they you know she was the only one in there who wasn't masked into some kind of contamination suit um you know they all the all the doctors were wearing contamination suits and treating her like an alien um and it was like an extra traumatic experience beyond what it normally would have been anyway mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And she actually went through without any drugs and she made a video on her experience, which was really powerful. But yeah, especially during these times, it's crazy. Yeah. I'll, st I'll stop interjecting now, but I, I just no, had to say that. I appreciate it. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I welcome it. Um, so one thing I want to just point out about that list of contraindications, notice that having a large baby is not on that list because that is probably the number one reason that doctors tell you we need to induce labor like your you know your due date is now we need to induce labor or you're you know you're one week past your due date we have to induce labor now because your baby's going to get too big um and by the way they use ultrasound usually to determine that ultrasounds during the third trimester are notoriously inaccurate for determining the baby size i mean i think about a third of the time they're close and two thirds of the time they're way off. Uh, fun measuring fundal height is actually a much more accurate way to determine the, to determine the baby's size in the third trimester, fundal height being the height of your uterus as measured from the outside of your belly. <clears throat> How many hospitals have said, oh, we're not going to do an ultrasound. We're going to get the tape measure out and <laughs> measure your belly. I mean, they don't do that. They like their gadgets and they just do it uh, no matter what the evidence evidence-based practices. Um, anyway, um, I, so I just want to point out that's not on the list. Um, and if you um, imagine like what a woman's um, birth canal looks like, um, it is not smooth. It is made of many 
uh, Rugi, R-U-G-A-E, these, their folds, these fold after fold after fold after fold that stretches longer than you can even imagine. So each fold just like stretches to the max and allows even the largest of babies to pass easily through the birth canal, okay? So even, you know, a 10, 11 pound baby easily pass through any birth canal because of these folds that just stretch. Um, second, the pelvic opening. So that's, you know, like, oh, you're too small, you know, your baby's gonna get too big. So the pelvic opening on a woman, the baby is knows how to exit the smallest part of the woman's pelvic opening um, with the smallest part of their head. And remember their, you know, their skull isn't fused. So they come out like looking like a little cone shaped <laughs> creature. <laughs> um, and, and that's part of why they come out slowly too. You know, if you just let your body's contractions move them down slowly, we don't need to push and try to make it as fast as possible, right? Um, if we let them come down at their own pace, they will easily fit through our pelvic bones because I have numbers here. Um, so a, the average pelvic measurements range from 11 centimeters to 13 centimeters wide. Um, so like say we have a, like a smaller woman who's got an 11 centimeter opening to her pelvic bone. Um, a fetal head's diameter is a maximum of 9.5 centimeters, okay? So there's no reason to believe that a woman's body is going to create a baby that's too big to be born through her body. Has it happened before? I don't know, maybe, but <laughs> I, I would think it was, I would think it's very, very uncommon for that to happen. Um, and doctors use it as a, just a run, just a routine excuse to, to induce labor. Um, and I mean, really it's, it's malpractice, I, I would say. And to give C-sections as well, because when you mention a baby not being too big, like even a 10 or 11 pound baby being able to fit through the birth canal, that was the reason why they told my mother to have a C-section because I was a 10 and a half pound baby. And wow. so yep. they, that was, that was the reasoning. And so mm -hmm. she had a C-section wow. and there was no real reason to do that. It seems like. No, no, there wasn't. There wasn't. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, my heart goes out to her because uh, we know from Anastasia that, you know, she's talked about how, what were her words, something about how doctors only prolong the suffering of slaves. <laughs> and I remember yeah. I read that. I was like, dang, she is spot on. <laughs> it's real. It's, it's but, tough, but it's real. It is. Yeah, it is. And, um, but you know, women trust their doctors and, um, and well, the sad truth is you know, doctors are, I mean, they learn to do what they do. Um, pharmaceutical companies pay for their, you know, pay for their education. So it's just a circle of corruption that, um, that we can break through, you know, if we're educated. So, and, and a big part of that is healing the, the trauma that has happened to us. And, and I believe that we can do that. Um, well so said. to head off these, um, that big list of contraindications about, you know, reasons you shouldn't give birth at home. Um, I want you to remember, we, the good news is we are, we have ultimate control over our health. So if we prepare our bodies for carrying a baby, for, just for being healthy in general, for ourselves, not just for our baby, but before we conceive a child, you know, we get our bodies ready to do it well. <laughs> and, um, and then we have no problem. And uh, this is from chapter one. Um, so some advice from Anastasia is the, the title of the chapter. <clears throat> if you make connections with the plants in your garden plot, they will take care of you and cure you. They will make the right diagnoses all by themselves and prepare the most effective medicine, especially designed for you. So um, that's one way that we can heal our bodies um, and get ready to have a really positive birth experience before we ever get pregnant. Um, so 
now let's um let's get into uh some reading about v Roos birth so this is in book 8.2 and a lot of this speaks for itself so i'm not going to read the whole thing because some of it is just um uh some parts of the birth right are um you know go go back and read the chapter yourself definitely but i'll just kind of read some highlights about the vidru's birth um, the birthing mother's mama and grandma would tell her what symptoms to expect on the eve of her labor vidru's women as a rule gave birth in their own homes in a wooden tub something like our bathtub um, and it was filled with pure spring water heated to body temperature and there were little ledges on the outside which served as foot rests. <clears throat> the tub for birthing mothers was placed on the floor and oriented so that the woman sitting in it would be facing toward the rising sun. During a Vidru's birth, only the husband was to be present in the room with a birthing mother. Even the couple's parents and close relatives as well as experienced midwives were excluded. <clears throat> So, um, and then uh, she also includes here that nobody and nothing was supposed to distract the thought of the father, let alone the birthing mother from the reception of their child. So, um, you know, they were both very focused on, on the task and what they were supposed to do. The presence of the parents and midwife at the entrance to the domain, that's where everyone waited, was outside the domain, you know, respectful distance. The presence of the parents and midwife at the entrance to the domain, however, had a calming effect on the young parents to be. In case any abnormalities cropped up, they could always come in to help, but there was rarely a need for such assistance. During the contractions, the mother would constantly talk with her emerging child, giving him words of encouragement, helping him to enter upon his new world without fear. The Vidru's people well knew how important it was to communicate both mentally and audibly with the new man as he emerged into the world. As a result, all three, mother, child, and father, were participants in the process. It was also very important that the mother's first look at her newborn be without any fright at his appearance, a temporarily stub snubbed nose, for example, or the birth color of his skin, that her gaze be tender and joyous. The father would pick up the baby out of the water he had been born in, use his own mouth right off to suck the mucus out of his little mouth and nose and place him on his mother's tummy. The mother then would offer the baby her breast. This prompted the expulsion of the placenta. <clears throat> um, after that, the father sat down and gazed silently at his wife. If she desired, he would talk with her, but even if she were asleep, he would not leave the room. He would then pour out the birthing water as well as the water with the woman had used to wash herself between the two trees which had been planted soon after conception. Here too was where the placenta would be buried. And she also includes, um, if some kind of outsiders, even a relative with good thoughts about the child happened to be in the birthing room, their feelings, even good ones, would be unfamiliar to the child and put him on the defensive. Besides, either deliberately or inadvertently, the relatives might distract the parents' thought from the infant. So, um, <clears throat> so that's uh, Vidru's birth, <laughs> which, I mean, reading that, it feels very real. You know, birth does not have to be painful. We should talk to our babies. We shouldn't make it so they don't fear what they're coming into. And um, I mean, this account it, is not a fantasy. This is, this is real. And this is something that we can all have, something that we can all have. Um, so now just uh, an overview of um, kind of pregnancy and birth and what that might look like uh, here and now. So, as for pregnancy, um, education is your ally. And this is a quote from Anastasia from book four. Uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about pregnancy because I think it's beyond the scope of this talk, which is already long. <laughs> um, but she says, quote, 
people do not pay enough attention to their whole experience leading up to the birth and many children are deprived of the planes of being inherent only in man. And so children are inevitably, inevitably born cripples. So she points out that not just the birth, but before the birth, it's so much important things are happening even before you conceive the child and then in the conception of the child and, and in the pregnancy. Um, so definitely we need to pay attention to it. <clears throat> like I said, a little beyond the scope of this talk, but it's, it is crucial. Birth is a tiny part of the story of bringing a man to earth. Um, I am going to read from that section of the, it's from book four about the planes of being. Um, she discusses how man lives on three planes of being and some things need to happen in order for man to exist on those three planes. So I'm so glad you're touching on this, by the way, it's because I think it's one of the most important things to think about. She, yes. The three planes of being like, if we get this right, we do such a service for our children. So yes. anyway, I'll Yes, thank you. And also pointing out that I'm going to talk about Anastasia's line later about how she had a poor mother who, you know, felt pain during birth. And, you know, it's okay that, like, you and I, not you specifically, Gabriel, but, you know, I, like, if, if, <laughs> I, if I was not born into the three planes of being, that's still something I can give to my child that he can then pass to his children. And so it's, it's still... I mean, it feels so hopeful for me. Like that is something so real I can, that I can give, you know, so. And, and I feel that, and this is something someone else mentioned in the comments earlier that giving our children this proper kind of birth and entrance into the world is like a rebirth to ourselves, you know? Absolutely. And, and me as a man, I, you know, I'm, I'm incapable of giving birth physically, but I've always felt that when my first child makes their appearance in the world, that that will be, a rebirth for my wife and myself as well. So it absolutely will be. It's, it's life-changing every I'm, Yeah. It's so transformative. It is a shamanic journey, you know, childbirth begins you, and you can't go back out the way you came. You have no choice, but to see it through to the end and be transformed by it. And mm. um, yeah. So mother and father and family are born in that moment that a child is born, you know, it's beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Um, but this chapter on the planes of being, when I reread this, I thought I need to reread this entire series again before, <laughs> before I get pregnant again, because there's <laughs> so much, there's so much this, these books are so dense with information that there's so much you forget when it's been a while since you've looked at them. So <laughs> Anastasia says, uh, man has a second self and each man should have a full set of all forms of energy, intellect, feelings, thought, and much else besides. The technocratic world aims to prevent the three most important points in newly born children from merging into one. Technocracy tries to break man's links with the divine mind and the links are broken before the child is born. And in looking for this connection, man goes searching the world in suffering and does not find it. Parents should impart to their co-creation the three most important points, the three primary planes of being. I'm excerpting here, I'm not reading the whole thing. Um, here is the first point of man's birth. It is called parental thought. Um, and then she kind of quotes, the Bible should say in the beginning was the thought. And um, she said the planting of the family tree on the part of the future parents will define this first point and this point in turn, will call upon the planets to aid them in their future co-creation. It is vital. It is important. <laughs> and above all else, it belongs to God. Thought is the origin of everything. <clears throat> the second point, or rather yet another human plane, will be born and light a new star in the heavens when two bodies merge into one, merge in love and with thoughts of a splendid creation in the very place where you build your paradise home, your living home for your future child. So second point is, um, you know, co-creating with intention, in love, and in your space of love. Um, and then the, a third point, a new plane of being should come about in that space, right there on the spot where the conception occurred, the birth should take place, and the father should stay close around. <clears throat> so 
um, the fact that how she talks about, you know, we are diminished even before we are born. In my mind, this is the testament to how powerful a man is, <laughs> you know, that a, a baby being born into the world is more powerful than many forces who would like to call themselves, you know, um, like claim some kind of authority over the earth or over humanity. You know, man is is the most powerful being in the universe. And that's that's a testament to that, I think. So giving our children the connection to those three planes is is crucial. So that's from book four. Um, if you want to look at that again, it's in his image and likeness is the title of the chapter. Um, <clears throat> so uh, part of how we can have a successful um, pregnancy and birth is, you know, before we become pregnant, that's something we need to think about, but also, you know, getting our body ready, um, having a healthy body and healing diseases of the flesh and the mind. Um, so things like having confidence our, in our own divinity and the power of a human being um, <clears throat> is one thing. Um, Anastasia just dis discussed a uh, connection to the plants in your garden plot. That's something that can heal your body. Um, divine nutrition is something she discussed and connections to, you know, to our own intuition. Um, I'm taking something of an intellectual approach to birth, but as Anastasia has said, you know, we were born with all of the information we will ever need inside of us. You know, you don't have to teach a dog how to have babies. <laughs> You don't have to teach a chicken how to lay an egg, do you? <laughs> they just know how to do it. So I think, you know, um, for some people, an important part of, of um, this process might be looking within and, and seeing what you learn from it. Um, and definitely having a, a strong connection to the earth is going to help us um, heal our um, our body and our emotions, our mind. So a few examples of other things, of ways that you might um, heal yourself before, um, before getting pregnant in order to make sure you're ready to have your natural birth um, and you don't have any of those contraindications that say you should be in the hospital. Um, maybe a change in diet, like the divine nutrition, like trying that out for a while fasting is excellent. I love fasting. I did, I did do a fast before I got pregnant with my son and with that intention that, you know, I wanted to get my baby house ready. <laughs> and, um, it, it was, I did a water fast for, my goal was 10 days. I made it nine days. So I called it a successful nine day fast, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, there seeing a shamanic healer is a great thing. That's something that I did too. I had a couple soul retrievals and I found those to be extremely helpful. Maybe a change in habits is needed. Um, for me, I was watching way too much TV <laughs> before my son was born. We got rid of our TV. <laughs> um, and, um, something that, uh, and I think she's in this call, Sarah Redman is a community member, turned me on to this. She's a rebirthing practitioner. And we talked already about kind of healing your own birth trauma to keep yourself from passing it on to children. Um, doing a, having a rebirthing experience, what a powerful way to reset that and to, um, you know, to, to give your children truly a, a clean slate is to, to heal your own birth trauma. So um, you can talk to Sarah about that. And, um, and this was a, a suggestion from Rhea, who had an unassisted birth. She said she, she watched a lot of videos of natural births. And I, I read a lot of accounts of natural births. And that was so helpful to me too, because, you know, every birth is different. But, you know, when you read about women doing it, it's, um, it's empowering. You just, I mean, you really feel um, camaraderie with those women and, you know, that we're all, we're all connected um, and by connected by motherhood, you know? Um, so those are some suggestions for 
um, ways that you can get your body and your mind ready for, for carrying a, a child. I'd like to add one thing um, out of the many things I could add, but meditation as well. Thank you. Uh, yes. For its ability to uh, strengthen positive neural pathways in the brain and deactivate reactive habitual negative reactions that are undesirable and it's astounding ability to heal trauma of the past um but you know by rewiring the brain so i'd love to thank you throw so that throw that in up. there yeah yeah yes and i hope if you guys have some suggestions you'll put them in the chat too because that's just what i could <laughs> come up with off the top of my head but yeah. I, there are if countless ways we can do this if you guys have any suggestions, maybe we could read them off in the chat, but th this is a very well-educated group of people here. So this is, I'm sure they have many great ideas, but anyway, you can continue, yeah. Emily. Okay, okay. So um, <clears throat> so just a, kind of a summary of some of Anastasia's general recommendations regarding pregnancy and or conception. Um, something to remember, in, well, in book four, um, she does talk about how we women have the power to end all wars in a single generation by refusing to reproduce destructive thinking, right? Um, if, we, if we don't co-create with men who think destructive thoughts, then um, we don't reproduce it over and over again. And um, we heal the world that way. <laughs> so remember. <laughs> Uh, and then she, just to recap with the three planes, you know, conceive children in your thoughts first. The thought is the origin of everything. Then co-create intentionally with your soulmate in a space of love. Um, give birth there where you conceived. And she also suggests to stay on your kin's domain during your pregnancy. Um, and she, I can't remember which book this was in, but she gave uh, an explanation that it's the safest place for her because when you're in a space of love, like everything there is protecting you. Um, I remember the poisonous apples. Well, the apples that um, <laughs> the, was it a wise man, wise man who said, um, you know, I do, I do not give you this apple freely. <laughs> and he took a bite and just fell to the ground. Yeah. <laughs> right. The Roman the soldiers who were yeah. invading the kin's domain settlement. Yes. So, you know, your space of love protects you. And also a woman knows uh, which foods from her domain are going to be beneficial to her during her pregnancy. And um, she might not have that knowledge of plants outside her domain. So, um, <clears throat> so that was kind of a general recommendation she made as well. And then also, um, and I'll read a quote on this later, but also that you can kind you can choose when the baby comes within the measure of a few days. You can choose a suitable day and time to, to birth your baby. So very interesting. <clears throat> on to the actual birthing, moving on from pregnancy to, to birthing the baby. So we're gonna do just a really rudimentary overview of childbirth, of, of two primary hormones that um, are Im very important in the birth process. Um, so the first, there are lots of hormones that play important roles, but the first one we're going to talk about is oxytocin. So we talked about pitocin, which was the synthetic oxytocin. This is the real thing. The, so oxytocin is also called the love hormone because oxytocin is actually secreted during any intimacy. So when you hug someone, when you conceive a child, you're secreting oxytocin. Probably the first time you met your partner, you, you both secreted oxytocin. Um, and then it kind of just goes in hand, hand in hand that um, oxytocin is the primary actor in birth that um, oxytocin activates and moves labor along. So um, this also ensures that the man and woman and child are bound together in love at the moment of the child's emergence, because everyone gets a shot of oxytocin when the baby is born. And, um, you know, it, it permanently bonds them together as a family. That's, that is the birth of the family. 
Um, also, oxytocin is an important factor in breastfeeding. Women secrete oxytocin when they are breastfeeding. So, um, you know, it's it cannot be underestimated how important oxytocin is. So um, this release of this oxytocin, like that moment of emergence is so strong that every person in the room when a child is born gets a shot of oxytocin. So if you have midwives who are in the room, they get a shot of oxytocin, even um, seeing that baby come out just because it's such a, you know, in such a powerful moment. And um, <clears throat> when Anastasia birthed Vladimir Jr., I, <laughs> I looked for it, I couldn't find it in the books. So I'm just going off memory. Um, she, I remember she said that her animals um, stood at the kind of the edge of the glade and to witness the baby being born. They weren't too close, probably because, you know, that'd be foreign to the baby. They needed to keep their distance. Um, and she said that those animals protected Vladimir Jr. with all of their own motherly instincts. And this release of oxytocin at the moment of birth is the physiological mechanism for what she's described there. That, you know, anyone viewing that birth, like anyone seeing it happen is going to be bound to that child and is going to want to protect that child. So it was a very powerful moment. <clears throat> so oxytocin is a yay, yay for, for childbirth. Um, the second hormone we're going to talk about is adrenaline, and this is the stress hormone. This is a nay for childbirth, okay? And um, the problem with adrenaline is it is secreted if any stressor affects the mother, okay? The secretion of adrenaline suppresses the secretion of oxytocin, okay? So with the presence of any stressor, we are going to see... Um, interruptions in the, in labor. And this is for good reason. It's so that the mother does not birth her baby into a dangerous environment. Um, so, I mean, it's not to punish anyone. It's, it's, you know, that's what it's supposed to do. The problem is um, women are often fearful or they're put in situations that cause adrenaline release. And then, um, and then it causes complications in their labor. Um, so anyway, this adrenaline uh, causes involuntary muscle tension, including the tension of the uterus, okay? So the contractions, like when, you know, oxytocin is flowing and you're in labor, the contractions are supposed to, like, you know, your cervix is closed like this, um, are relaxing and opening the, the cervix. And the adrenaline just like tenses everything up and um, causes a lot of times that is the cause of the pain is the fact that the woman is stressed. She has a stressor present. So um, I have a really great example of how adrenaline is a good thing and can protect your baby. Okay. My partner, Joe, um, <clears throat> when he was, when his mom was pregnant with him, um, she was in a car accident and flew out the window of the car, you know, several yards away. And um, in that moment, before she hit the ground, you know, she would have felt fear, mm, adrenaline. And then the uterus tenses up and becomes like a shell, like a hard shell protecting the baby. So, you know, when she landed on the ground, luckily, Joe was fine. He, he was born you know, without any problems or complications as a result of the car accident. So this adrenaline is a really important, plays a really important role in protecting our babies from being born into dangerous situations, protecting them from, you know, harm in the case of an accident. Um, but the, the problem with that is um, we, you know, we have this muscle tension when we're trying to birth our babies often. And the uterus is so strong that, I mean, the uterus is a strong muscle. And if the baby is ready to be born and it's happening, a lot of times the uterus will go ahead and birth the baby anyway, even with the presence of the adrenaline. But 
the problem is it'll cause pain then because you're working against it with the adrenaline and the stress. So therefore adrenaline is the main actor of <clears throat> what is called the fear tension pain cycle. So there's a man called Grantley Dick Reed. He wrote a book called Childbirth Without Fear back in the 1940s. This man was ahead of his time. And um, he discussed how all pain in childbirth comes from um, fear is the first part bit. You know, a woman is fearful about something. She maybe is fearful about pain during childbirth. She's fearful about being a mother you know, fearful about something uh, which causes tension in her uterus because of the adrenaline release, which causes pain. Okay. So, um, any stressor is going to do this. Other stressors include transporting a laboring mother, think rushing to the hospital, <laughs> you know, um, the hospital environment is a stressor, bright lights, strangers, um, constantly having your service cervix checked. Um, what else? Um, being hooked up to a bunch of IVs um, and, you know, fetal monitor and, um, you know, being treated like a someone who's ill. They put you in a wheelchair. To, um, uh, maybe someone is there who you don't want to be there. That's, it's really important to, to plan to only have people present at your birth who, who you want to have there. Uh, maybe someone's absent who you want to be with you. Uh, maybe you don't feel ready to be a parent. Any of these things will, you know, activate this fear, tension, pain cycle and cause pain or complications in your birth. Um, so some solutions to your stressors, definitely education, logic, intuition, and decision-making in terms of you know, where are you giving birth? Who's going to be there? Um, you know, being armed with information that's going to be helpful in case of, you know, abnormalities cropping up. <clears throat> and like I said earlier, going to the hospital is the first intervention of childbirth. So um, transporting any laboring mammal suppresses labor. You know, researchers have done that with lab rats and all kinds of animals many times, we know it suppresses labor when you transport a mother, um, you know, she, she wants privacy um, and, uh, you know, moving her to the hospital is a really good way to right off the bat cause complications in the, the delicate balance of hormones that are happening in her body. Um, also important to note that when you are in labor, you're in an altered state your brain waves are like delta brain waves. And when you are constantly um, being like measured and checked and, um, you know, like I said, the bright lights, it's, um, it's not, uh, not conducive to, to a natural labor that, that allows birth to happen <clears throat> easily. So all of those things can cause complications and or pain. Okay. Um, and childbirth does not have to be painful. Um, Anastasia said how, you know, Eve, which I'll read about her later, Adam and Eve, um, Eve did not feel pain during birth. The Vid Roos did not feel pain during birth. Um, there's a really great documentary called Orgasmic Birth. It's on the, um, resources list, but many women have ha given birth without pain. And that is absolutely a real thing. I would love um, to hear from some of you women if that was true for you. And I'll get to, to it later about me. Uh, that was not true for me. And I know why now, and I'll more on that later, but um, I would love to hear from a woman who, who gave birth with no pain. Um, <clears throat> so first let's talk about um, what Anastasia has said on pain during childbirth. So um, this was this is in book four. <clears throat> okay. Um, so she discussed, so after Veed Roos times, um, human thought faltered and 
um, for the first time, men began possessing the women and women submitted to the men, not for the sake of co-creation, but so that both of them could experience a satisfying sensation. The sad consequence of these carnal pleasures has been their children. The children were deprived of conscious aspirations toward the goal of realization of the divine dream and women began experiencing pain in childbirth and the rising generation was doomed to live in torment in the absence of the three planes of being meant they were afforded no opportunity of attaining happiness in any way and so we come down to the present day <clears throat> and then she talks about her foremother who was one of the first women to experience chain and pain in childbirth and um she <clears throat> the man who <clears throat> who had sex with her um, was indifferent to the birth and she was very angry at God and she abandoned her little baby. <clears throat> I'm sorry if it's, it's so emotional for me. <laughs> um, You're okay. It's, it's, it's emotional for everybody. And, um, <clears throat> you know, and well, the whole thing was it, it made her resentful. She was, she was resentful of this pain that she experienced, um, not fully understanding why her, you know, why her. And um, while well, something I get from this story is not only the, the possibility that we can rise above that, that we don't have to feel pain in childbirth, but also that the choices we make today co-creating with love and intention, it, it permanently alters the entire course of humanity, really. I mean, even Anastasia's ancestors weren't perfect, right? I mean, her foremother, like, did this horrible thing of <laughs> abandoning her baby. Um, and, you know, in the end, it had to happen for, um, for us to be here talking to each other because it set in motion the events that led to Anastasia being Anastasia. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, you know, well said. we can give our, we can give our children um, a good start, no matter what kind of start we had. Right. Um, <clears throat> so next, uh, so birth could be like, is sometimes painful for women. That's very true, but it does not have to be. So let's talk about um, some of our assumptions about birth that might be incorrect. Um, <clears throat> so this next statement is uh, birth happens involuntarily, okay? So a woman's body is going to birth a baby, whether she, as long as she doesn't get in its way, <laughs> okay? She doesn't have to do anything extra. And this is not usually something we think of as being true, but a woman's body births a baby involuntarily. So um, some of what I've seen is like, you do what the birth is asking of you in that moment and nothing extra, right? Like uh, <clears throat> the exam an example I read, this was from the book called Brave New Birth, also on the resources list. But you know, a chicken will like turn her egg like once a day or something to make sure it stays warm on all sides. She doesn't like turn it so often and like peck holes in it, right? She doesn't do anything extra. She just does what her instinct is, what her intuition is asking of her. So when um, we're giving birth, any feeling of pain is a message. The same thing that Anastasia has said about a disease like if you feel disease if you feel pain that's it's a message it's communication with god is what she said but um sometimes a woman in labor might feel like something pain um maybe she needs to change position maybe she needs to change location maybe she needs to change her mindset um birth affirmations are a great way to do that but uh you know birth happens involuntarily and just perfectly almost every time if we let it happen. So that brings me to pushing um, because that's the, like, if you, when I even say that, there's like a flash in my mind of like a sweaty woman in a hospital gown, like, 
like trying is, you know, like in so much pain and like there's so like my programming was so strong on this that um, even in my own birth, I made a mistake. Um, but women who do not push actually have the best birth outcomes. Okay. So, um, so if you imagine a woman who is <clears throat> like paralyzed, she can't feel the, like any pressure telling her to push, or maybe she can't push because she's paralyzed. Um, and cardiovascular patients who have, car not patients, but uh, laboring women who have cardiovascular problems and who are coached not to push because their heart isn't strong enough. These two groups of women are the ones who end up with the best birth outcomes, actually, because um, contractions, you know, they first work to, they open the cervix. And once the cervix is open, the contractions move your baby down the birth canal all by themselves. <laughs> okay. Like that's, it's as simple as that. And, um, some women will feel the urge to push, um, you know, for a little while, sometimes the urge to push comes and goes, but, uh, and this is called fetal ejection reflex. When a woman gives birth without pushing that the baby just bloop, spills out <laughs> without, without any extra pushing or work. And, What's so interesting about this is that we see that as the main part of giving birth as a woman pushing the baby out when it does not, it should not be that way in our minds because that's not how it is in reality. I, I want to jump in real quick here, Emily. There's a woman in the chat. She's saying, Wow, now I realize that every social media mainstream depiction of labor is one of pain and screaming. Yes. You know, every movie you ever watch, every TV show you ever watch, it's a woman exactly as you described, Emily, in agonizing pain yes. and sweating and just blood curdling screams. Yes. You know? And the urgency, like there's always this urgency, like I have to get the baby, get the baby out, out as, fast as fast as possible. As possible. And right. the truth is that pushing usually does not make the birth happen faster or better. Um, and it can cause a lot of complications besides. So, I mean, imagine being in the, ho in a hospital setting and in the hospital setting, they absolutely coach you to push. That's why they check your dilation every hour, because when you are 10 centimeters dilated, they say, okay, now it's time to push. <laughs> Whether you feel like pushing or not, it's time do it now, <laughs> you know? And, um, and this, so what I've learned about pushing is it is best to push only if, or when you have the urge to do so, not because someone in the room thinks you should be okay. And that person might be you. <laughs> and that's, that was my mistake in the birth of my son is I was the person in the room who thought I was just supposed to push because that's what you do. <laughs> and um, so I mentioned before that I did not feel pain really during my birth. <clears throat> um, you know, I intense is the best word to describe. There's just so much energy moving through your body during the contractions. So, you know, so really intense, but I was, I felt perfectly equipped to handle it. I did not feel pain until Let's see. So I felt the urge to push when I first got in the water. And a lot of times a woman will feel the urge to push, um, to get the baby through the cervical opening. But then once the head gets down into the birth canal, a lot of times the urge to push goes away. Um, and in my case, honestly, I don't even know if the urge, like, I can't even remember if I felt the urge to push after that or not, because I was not listening to my body anymore. I, um, I just thought, oh, now it's time to push. And I pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed until the baby came out because that's what I thought I was supposed to do. And, um, when the baby, when my son was coming through the birth canal, I, I did start feeling pain, like, and, um, and I kept saying to my midwife, how many more pushes, how many more pushes <laughs> and, and, um, I'm not criticizing my midwives. I love them. This, I see this as my own, um, programming again, you know, affecting my experience, not them, but she said, 
you can always push one more time, just focus on the next push and, you know, don't think about anything besides that. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> so I did that as best as I could, but um, I did, like I mentioned before, I did start bleeding while I was pushing too. And remember I was feeling pain as well during this time. And again, that bleeding, I mean, that was a message from my body. You're doing something wrong, <laughs> you know, something needs to change. And um, this communic it was it was an opportunity for me to to listen to my body, but my programming was too strong. And um, yeah, I so you know when it was all over, I um, I kind of looked back and I thought now, and I I didn't I didn't learn until recently about this this pushing thing that women don't have to push that much. And I, I looked back on my experience after and I thought, no, why was it painful? Um, because, you know, I knew that it was possible to have a baby without pain. And, um, you know, and I was really open to that experience. So, uh, so I kind of, I just kind of filed it away. Like, you know, maybe I can figure that out another time. I, I, I don't know why this happened. Um, and it, you know, this pushing, you know, with the bleeding often causes complications like hemorrhaging. That's, that's a big one that, you know, again, someone in my family, my grandma was trying to um, spook me into giving birth at a hospital. And she was like, if you hemorrhage, you know, you could, you could die. And, um, you know, the hemorrhaging usually happens because a woman is being coached to push. Um, and. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, and when women are free to listen to their bodies and, and trust their bodies to tell them what to do, things happen so much better. <laughs> and um, so I don't know, my advice there is like, listen, listen to your body. Yeah. But I, I spent like two, almost two years scratching my head, like, now why did I feel pain? Because even after I read the Anastasia books, I, um, you know, I learned uh, that, you know, Anastasia talks about the, you know, the three planes of being and that, you know, women can feel pain in childbirth um, when they create a baby out of lust, you know, rather than trying to co-create. But actually, you know, we, um, you know, my son, he was created in thought first. We conceived him intentionally and in love. Um, he was born the same spot he was um, conceived. So even after I read that, I thought, now what is going on here? <laughs> and finally, I came across that tidbit in the book called Brave New Birth. And it clicked for me that, oh, I just wasn't listening to my body. So you know, what Anastasia describes about, um, and well, actually, I'm going to read a bit of what Anastasia's grandfather said about her birth um, and about pain during childbirth here, um, because I, I see these as both being true, like, you know, um, aligning your child on the three planes of being and, um, you know, listening to our body and self-directing our, our childbirth. I think that's all part of having a pain-free birth. So this is from book two, um, Anastasia's grandfather and Vladimir are having a conversation here. So Vladimir says, uh, she's really something, eh? She's had a child. She said she would have one and she did. Alone out there in the taiga, not in any hospital. It must have been painful for her. Did she cry out? Now, why would you think it was painful for her? Well, women, when they give birth, it's painful. Some of them even die during childbirth. It's painful only when a child is conceived in sin. As a result of fleshly, fleshly lusts, women pay for this with pain in childbirth and torments afterward in life. If the conception takes place with higher aspirations, the pain only intensifies the feeling of the great joy of creation on the part of the mother. Where does the pain go then? How can it intensify joy? When a woman is raped, what does she feel? Of course, she feels pain and revulsion. But when she gives in of her own free will, that same pain is transformed into different sensations, 
The same is true in regard to childbirth. Does that mean Anastasia experienced a painless childbirth? Of course it was painless, and she chose a suitable day, a warm and sunny day. What do you mean she chose? Childbirth happens quite unexpectedly. <clears throat> unexpectedly if the conception simply takes place by chance. A mother is capable of delaying or accelerating her baby's appearance by a few days. So um, <clears throat> yeah, just a word about, you know, Anastasia's experience giving birth and um, yeah, we have control over so much, really we do. That's powerful. Um, a woman in the chat was saying right before you read that, that excerpt, she says, uh, and when does sensation turn into pain? Is it when the mom takes over control of the birth? So it's an interesting question. Yeah, that is. I, I mean, I feel, I feel like you just kind of addressed it there, you know, mm -hmm. um, the, the preconditions for, you know, having a, a painless birth, but it's, it's just an interesting thing. Yeah, it is. It is. When the sensation and, turn into pain. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I wanted to jump into, I had a question personally um, about pushing and all of that stuff. I was going to save it for the Q&A section, but I, I haven't seen anyone mention it here, so I wanted to bring it up. I recently read that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm definitely not a woman and certainly not an expert on the subject, but that women have some kind of muscle during the birth that kind of builds up tension uh, like a band. And then at a certain point, the tension is just kind of released and the baby comes out of its own accord. I think I, the name of it is like the fundus or something. It's fundus, which yeah. is the, it's the, the uterus actually is the fundus. Yeah. Okay. The, that's, that is the. Yeah. The, I don't know. <laughs> um, the super muscle. Yes. And that is exactly how it happens. And actually I watched a video of a baby being born in like a, oh geez, like it showed the woman must have been inside of like an ultrasound machine or something, which I definitely don't recommend while you're giving birth. But I watched this video and it showed the baby when it went to, to, to emerge from the, <clears throat> from the, you know, birth canal into the world, it pushed off with its legs, like it was swimming <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and the babies really do have such an active role in birth and that's part of why um c-sections are so detrimental in my view because it you're robbing the baby's first victory from them that is a victory for the baby being born just showing up in this world is uh you know it's a rite of passage it's the stargate <laughs> and um so when you take that from them it's i think it positions them for a lot of um a lot of problems later on you know associated with that in their life so um does that do you have anything to add to that gabriel yeah that that makes a lot of sense it's i was just reading about this you know trying to expand my understanding and it seemed that you know the fundus uterus kind of built up tension throughout the the labor and then um, it kind of grows in size and eventually just kind of pushes the baby out but as you're saying it's it's an effortless thing it's a it's a process that isn't like controlled and kind of just happens and you and and it it it, it is speaking against this whole ideology of pushing you know, right. Uh, right. And, and all the harm that that can cause. It's saying that the body is naturally building up this tension, building up the size That's of right. the, the fundus, and then the baby then emerges be, as a result of that. But it's involuntary, as you say. That's right. Involuntary. And yes, yes. And um, it's, uh, and like I said, women will have the urge to push sometimes to help it along, but we don't, we should not push without the urge to push. That's, that's the main um, takeaway from that. Right. Yeah. That's all I had to say about it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for adding that. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so uh, yeah. So listening to your body, that's the name of the game. And actually 
my partner, Joe gave me before the birth, he gave me a piece of advice that I didn't realize until later how profound the advice was. But he said to me, it wants to happen. You know, like the baby, the childbirth wants to happen. He said, it wants to happen. You just need to get out of its way. And um, I thought that was solid advice at the time, but you know, what I've learned since then, it was even more profound that, you know, I, so many things we do can act against the, the birth that's trying to happen, you know, the baby that's trying to be born. So um, getting out of its way is uh, just a solid piece of advice. <laughs> so um, birthing man in joy is our birthright. You know, we are human beings. It's our birthright to bring men into the world. And um, it goes without saying that that birth is transformative for women. And as Gabriel was saying before, it's transformative for men too. And I have a quote. This is my, I think my favorite quote in the whole series that I'm going to read to you. I, it's, I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's quite long, but it's concerning Adam and Eve's birth. Um, and it speaks to the transformative uh, experience of childbirth for, for men also. So um, hold on, do I have the right book? So um, Eve says to Adam, feel here inside me lives my creation a new creation at the same time. Can you feel it, Adam? It, is it pushing this restless creation of mine? Yes, I can feel it. It seems to be reaching out to me. To you, of course, it, it is mine, but it is yours too. I very much want to see our co-creation. And Eve gave birth, not in painful labor, but in great wonder. Forgetting everything around him, not conscious of himself, Adam watched and trembled in anticipation and Eve bore a new and conjugal creation. A tiny wee lump, all wet, lie helplessly on the ground. Its legs were drawn up tight, its eyelids remained closed. Adam watched, his eyes fixed on the little one, as it moved its tiny hand, opened its tiny lips, and took its first breath. Adam was afraid to blink lest he missed the tiniest movement. Unfamiliar feelings had begun filling the space within and around him. Unable to restrain himself to the spot, he suddenly leapt up and began to run with no particular destination in mind. <clears throat> and everything fused and blended together into a single resounding intonation of the tenderest sounds of music known through all God's grand creation. After taking a little more air into his lungs, Adam suddenly cried out as loud as he could. It was not an ordinary cry, not that of an animal, but one that overflowed with the most tender sounds, a long sublime hush slowly settled all around. And for the very first time, the universe heard a man on the earth joyfully burst into song. <laughs> a man was singing. And all the noises that had before sounded throughout the galaxies were now grounded. <clears throat> a man was singing. And hearing this happy song, the whole, <clears throat> sorry, I'm emotional. It's okay. The whole world of the universe concluded, not in any of the galaxies could there, <clears throat> could there be found a single string capable of producing a better sound than that of the singing of the human soul. <laughs> but the song of rejoicing could not hush Adam's newfound abundance of feelings. <clears throat> and he rushes to Eve. Um, and with new might, love began shining within and around Adam in invisible delight. And then all at once, oh, how love universal quivered and shivered to see Adam run up to the resplendent maiden mother, fall on his knees before Eve, press his hands to her golden braids, her tender lips and her milk-filled breasts. And restraining his exclamation to a gentle purr, he tried to express his exultation in words. Eve, my Eve, my wife, you are able to make dreams come true. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, I am woman, your wife. Let us turn into life everything you are able to think of. <laughs> yes, together, the two of us together, now it is clear, two together are we. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I just, uh... I, I'm not crying, you're crying. 
that is just such the singing of the human soul. The first time a man broke into song was um, at the birth of his child, you know, at the birth of his family. So just, uh, you know, it's so profound for every person. Yeah, for every person. Oh, <clears throat> okay, so um, we're going to kind of conclude this a little bit. So I just want to um, remind you here, um, Vladimir did like to contrast that really like beautiful, lovely vision of, um, you know, this birth and great wonder, this exaltation and um, just joy, just pure joy. Um, Vladimir, when he looked into the history of maternity wards, you know, what we would now call like the, the hospital maternity ward, it was founded by slaveholders. Um, institutionalizing birth gave slaveholders immediate control over the slave children. You know, slaves were giving birth in maternity wards. The elite of those countries would never dream of giving birth anywhere but in their homes. And um, when when we take back birth, they don't have control over our children anymore. They don't have control over our bodies or our families, we do. So it's just crucial to, you know, to educate ourselves, to, um, you know, to take back birth, to, to make it ours again. And um, that is, you know, when we heal families, that's the building block for healing the earth is strong family connections. And I'm going to end um, <clears throat> that part. Vladimir said something very um, profound in, I don't remember which book, but the quote stuck with me. He said, what is fearsome is powerless to a fearless man. So the would-be controllers of our society, um, you know, they are fearsome, but they are powerless to us, the fearless men of the, of the earth. <laughs> Um, so to just to qualify that we are each responsible for the outcome of our births. That means that having a plan, if things don't go as we wish they will, you know, in my birth, I packed a hospital bag. I had a birth plan in case I ended up in the hospital to, you know, like a sheet of paper to give them, you know, show, showing them what I wanted. And, um, I also want to include you know, there are women who want to have a natural birth and, um, you know, plan for such. And sometimes emergencies do happen. They are rare when we let things happen the natural way. But if you wanted a natural birth and it didn't happen, I just want to say you are not a failure. You're a warrior because you knew it wasn't ideal. It wasn't exactly what you wanted but you did what you needed to do to bring your baby here safely, right? So, you know, you are not a failure if your birth doesn't go exactly as you plan. You know, we need to, it's just important to be realistic about our outcomes. We do the best we can and that's all we can do. <laughs> so, um, so Amen. Knowing, yeah, yeah. So knowing what I know, I, I will use midwives again. I valued the prenatal companionship the most, just, you know, talking about my baby and they, you know, use the fetoscope to check the heartbeat and they felt for the positioning and I valued that. And they, um, <clears throat> but, you know, you have the right to give birth where and with whom you feel the most comfortable and you don't need anyone's permission to do so. And like I said before, all of the information you need is, is within you you know, so, um, so everyone needs to decide what they want for themselves. And so just to conclude with some of what Anastasia has said, um, birth is not only your right, it is a right, R-I-T-E, you know, we are transformed by birth. Um, Eve gave birth, not in pain, but in great wonder, um, a man's birth is joyful. And this is a quote from Anastasia, quote, the universe will be a faithful servant to the splendid creation these two people have produced in love. And very last um, from 
the chapter, I am giving birth to you, my angel from, oh, I think it's book 8.1. Um, <clears throat> the, the man in that story says he wanted all men to know that, quote, true and lasting love comes only when together with your beloved, you give birth to a long desired child. So just all around one of the most impactful and life-changing events that will ever happen to you. So <laughs> that concludes and, my spiel. <laughs> and I, and I, Emily, you are incredible. And I wanted to add one more quote to the end there from book four. Oh, please. The, ch the chapter, the beginning of creation, where the, en the entities of the universe are asking God, what do you so fervently desire? Everyone inquired. Oh, and, yes. And he, confident in his dream, replied, conjoint creation and joy for all from its contemplation. And what may bring joy to everyone in the universe? Birth. You know? Birth, yes. And, and it's, listening to you speak is just really illustrates the power of that. And so thank you um, for everything you did here. Guys, round of applause for Emily in the chat um you know emily you gotta you gotta check out the chat um wow just a, a tour de force on this on this most valuable subject here um so that was a powerful experience for everybody watching i i'm moved um arianne is moved everybody is is moved um that was it was incredible um so you guys I are want... so kind <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> please check check out the chat emily if you're able to open thank it you. look yeah look, look I, I see thank yeah. you yeah beautiful thank you everybody yeah um that was incredible and so uh we can move into the the q a section now if you're ready i don't know if you absolutely need a, i am ready need some water okay <laughs> cool and i wanted to start you know um Forgive me, guys. I'm not trying to be selfish here, but I wanted to start um, with a question of my own to kind of hopefully frame up some of the other questions that that may be there. Um, and I'll feed you the questions, Emily, as you know, uh, you know, I'll just feed them to you here. But um, one of my questions, and we're, we're talking about pushing and how much effort a woman needs to put in and birth happening involuntarily. And all this makes me wonder, is the term labor? a <laughs> a misnomer absolutely and, and, yeah. and how much of a labor is there really and if we don't use the term labor what is it that we are actually describing what is that um i'm glad you brought that up because as i was putting this presentation together i was like i, I shouldn't call it labor but it's just such that's that's the term and it's it's by design they want us to think of it that way <laughs> you know they whoever they are but um I, labor is absolutely a misnomer um and you know it's that image that we talked about that you know the sweating pushing urgency um you know that's it elicits those you know it's connected with that that connotation and i think um you know we can just call it childbirth instead um a birthing woman rather than a laboring woman um maybe would be a, a better term but from <clears throat> what i know now which this book um i learned so much from this book brave new birth that i hadn't read anywhere else um so i highly recommend by andrea olson but um there are many resources um you know old and new that talk about how you know women don't need to do anything extra to help the birth happen that they you know they just need to um you know relax they need to be given privacy and it's it should not be work you know it should not be that much work right does Thank that you. answer your question? <laughs> that answer that answers my question so much. And and just the perspective shift from laboring mother to birthing mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is I think that, that is a much better that's, term. 
That's such a change of the experience, a change of the energy, a change of the understanding of what's happening, you know, because it's, it's not a woman forcing a baby out at top speed. Right. Right. <laughs> it's, it's a woman taking all the time in the world she needs to bring in her child joyfully and peacefully mm -hmm. and, and, and a process that's just happening and she's facilitating this grand thing. It's, it's such a different thing. So I kind of wanted to frame up um, our conversation there. Um, so I will go through the, the rest of the questions here. Okay. Mark Landau asks, could you more, uh, could you describe more the sensations of painless, painless labor or painless birthing, as we would say, probably at this point? Um, okay, well, it's hard to, unlike, <laughs> it feels, it's unlike anything else. Like I said, I did not have a painless labor. It was, but I can say that it was the it was the the pushing section when he was coming through the the birth canal. So my contractions when um, I was birthing was uh, they were um, they were so intense and it just felt like a lot of energy and I could it's like I could feel my body opening like things were stretching in me that uh, or and like shifting because when the uterus opens it um like the muscle moves up like this and that's the kind of the tension you talked about like because the muscle to open at, opens at the bottom and moves up to the top to put tension down to bring the baby down, down. Yep. right and um so yeah things felt like they were like moving and stretching and opening but i yeah i just um just really intense um and a lot of it is a mind thing like in my mind i had some affirmations like you know visualizing the opening happening and and that was really helpful but it's uh any other mothers um who want to give input on this can but just uh yeah intense stretching and like movement, muscle movement inside my body, I guess I can describe it as. Yeah. Gotcha. Expansion. Got you. Oh, I, I saw in the chat, someone suggested yeah. the term expansion instead of contraction. And I've also heard um, Ina Mae Gaskin uses the word rush instead of contraction, because even again, let's talk about terminology, the word contraction makes you think tight, Titan, you know, and um, contractions, what they're really doing is opening and relaxing. So yeah, a shift in that terminology is good for the mind too. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. I was wondering about that. I'm glad that um, you saw that because, you know, I don't know what it feels like, uh, you know, an alleged contraction, but I'd imagine that that's a, that's a misnomer too there. Yes definitely is yeah um so we've got some more questions here uh this one so enjoying this info i was just thinking about the injustice of episiotomy episiotomies yeah. episiotomy done so commonly and such mm -hmm. an infection risk mm -hmm. um is there a question attached to that or I, I'm not sure if, okay. but, but it just well, seems like, it. yeah. Um, so episiotomy is when they make a cut on the woman's uh, perineum um, to widen the, uh, the vaginal opening to, to make it bigger. So they take a knife and actually cut the woman there um, right. to supposedly it'll make the, make it easier for the baby to pass through. Um, in many places, it has become less, a lot less common, um, but it used to be just absolutely every time a baby was born, cut, and doctors do it because it makes the baby have come faster and they want to get on to the next thing. You know, a doctor doesn't, <laughs> doesn't want to wait there for your baby to be born in its own time. They just, a lot of times they just want it to happen, you know, um, 
And yeah, it is a horrible injustice. Uh, I've talked to women who specifically asked their doc, told their doctor, I don't want an episiotomy. Um, and the doctor just totally ignored that desire and just did it anyway. They just don't even think about it. Just second nature, just cut. Um, and well, the, the silly, it's just, I mean, it's a horrible thing to do to a woman thinking that it's okay to cut her without her consent. <laughs> but um, also, you know, they argue like, oh, well, it's a cut, you know, if she, she's going to tear if she gives birth without an episiotomy, sometimes women's perineum tears, usually only if they're pushing, by the way, but um, that hap sometimes that happens. And um, there is no data that no data has ever shown that um, a tear is more likely to be infected than a cut. In fact, it's shown the opposite um, because usually tears are very small if they happen and uh, doctors tend to cut bigger than what a tear would be. Um, <clears throat> I, I did not tear at all in the birth of my son. So like, you know, I mean, I can't even imagine like you go to the hospital and they actually add more things you need to heal from after you, you know, your body's been through a, a big thing <laughs> and you know, you're sore the next day. And I, it's, it is a terrible injustice. Yeah, I agree. Wow. Right. They, they put all these uh, interventions create more problems that you have to heal from yeah it's, yeah they do uh wow good old western medicine gotta love it yeah. um so let's go to the next question here maureen is asking uh how long do you feel the placenta should stay intact before it's cut uh when it naturally dies and then she has a second question i guess i can ask after uh this one okay um so um, the placenta is a really amazing thing. Um, the baby is born. Um, the baby, they say, should be placed on the mother's belly, like over where the placenta would be attached to her. Like placenta is kind of like up here at the top of her. So put your baby, you know, on the belly and they can breastfeed there. Um, the breastfeeding of the baby triggers an oxytocin release in the mother, which, you know, I said oxytocin was the main actor in, in labor. So that oxytocin then triggers the release of the placenta from the uterine wall and the mother can then deliver the placenta. Very, very important for the cord to stay intact until after the placenta has been delivered and the, the cord stops pulsing. So when a baby is born, they are only born with um, like two thirds, is it one third or two third? I think it's two thirds of the, the total blood that should be in their body. The other third is in the placenta. So after the placenta is delivered, the placenta is loading the baby with the rest of the blood and um, <clears throat> like conventional, Western medicine practices are to, you know, cut the cord during that exchange when the baby is still getting the rest of its blood, which is horrible. You know, the baby needs that. So um, it's very important for the cord to stay intact until the, until the cord stops pulsing and turns white. That means the baby has gotten its full download of nutrients and blood from the placenta. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. So there's, um, another school of, uh, method of, uh, dealing with the placenta called a Lotus birth. And these people choose to keep the placenta and the cord attached to the baby until the cord naturally dries out and falls off. Um, <clears throat> it's up to, you know, every woman to decide what works for her. Um, in my birth, we cut the cord when it stopped pulsing because we wanted to keep the placenta. And I, I, I'm feeling the love in this room. So I'm just going to tell, I don't tell this to most people because, <laughs> you know, but I actually did um, 
I ate part of my placenta. That's what other mammals do. And, um, you know, I worked really hard to have really good nutrition during my pregnancy and to like avoid toxic stuff. So that, you know, consuming the placenta gave me a boost of nutrition. It's, um, you know, in traditional Chinese medicine, it, they use it to help with milk supply. So, so I did consume part of my placenta and, um, <clears throat> for the first, like, 10 days probably after birth. And then we put the rest of it in the freezer. And um, in the spring, we planted it under a tree for, for my son. So um, <clears throat> where was I going with that? Oh, so if you do a lotus birth, the placenta isn't going to be good to consume, obviously, after it's been sitting out for that long. It's You have to kind of treat it like you would treat meat, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, because it is an organ. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I hope that answers your your question. Yeah, I think that answers it. And that is a, a very common thing. A lot of people will opt to consume or perhaps encapsulate and mm -hmm. do it that way. And, um, you know, I'm not an expert, but I've heard of that. And then, you know, um, the, the Vedrus, I remember uh, Anastasia mentions that the father would be ready with a hot knife that was sterilized over a fire. Mm -hmm. And yep. they, they would, uh, she doesn't mention specifically that um that they waited until the placenta was finished pumping the blood but i'd imagine that's what they did because that just makes sense mm -hmm. and then they cut it with a, a knife and and then planted it under the tree um for for the child so very interesting stuff um and so the next question maureen had is in many indigenous cultures they feel it's important for the baby to touch the earth soon after birth thoughts um, I think it's a beautiful idea. I was, um, I gave birth indoors in December. <laughs> so I, I, um, I didn't do that with him. I wasn't turned on to that idea. I, th I think it sounds great. And well, I read, if you look at the, one of the resources, the Matrona, um, <clears throat> there's uh, a lot of cultures, they'll have like a mat on the ground prepared for the baby. And after the baby is born, they'll, um, the mother will catch the, the baby and set the baby down on the mat they've prepared on the ground, uh, face down because that will naturally bring the mucus out of the mouth and, or the amniotic fluid out of the, the mouth and nose of the baby. Um, so that probably is related to that, um, <clears throat> you know, desire to, touch the baby to the ground. But I, I think it's a beautiful idea to get, you know, get the baby grounded. I mean, they came here to earth. So let's show them earth. This is earth. <laughs> you know, it's a great idea. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and when you think about it, I guess Anastasia probably I think she gave birth under a tree or something, right? Like, just l leaning up against a tree. Yeah, um, I think she did. Yeah. And so there you go. Um, so who knows? Anyway, I, I won't say we should try giving birth under a tree. I, I can't really speak on that, but <laughs> it, it, it's certainly possible. Um, sure, so yeah, sure. here, here's another question from Rhea. Uh, I'll read out her whole question. She says, sometimes it's really hard finding a midwife. In the States, it's easier, but up here in Canada, I couldn't find one that wasn't going to do, that wasn't going to do a home birth with me. They just had a wing of the hospital that they birthed in and the doctors actually had control over the births. So what would you suggest to women who maybe don't have access to a midwife? Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a tough one. Um, well, some women, th there's kind of, you know, if you're not giving birth at home or in a hospital, there's kind of an in-between option that's a... <clears throat> Birth, uh, birth center birth center yeah birth center yeah and uh at a birth center it looks more like a like, kind of like a hotel room like it's not clinical like a hospital they have um some like some uh things to like maybe they have uh like nitrous oxide to like help you relax a little or but you know they don't have epidurals there they don't have um, the interventions that the hospital does, but they do have like an ambulance on standby 
this, this is mostly for women who, you know, who want a natural birth, but maybe they're nervous about giving birth at home, which women do have the right to give birth where they feel the safest. So, you know, a lot of women will choose a birthing center and feel like they're, you know, if something, some emergency were to happen, they're a little closer to the hospital and that makes them feel safer. That's great. Um, so maybe a birth center would be an option for those women. Um, maybe a retreat. I know, uh, I talked about Ina Mae Gaskin earlier. She, uh, was a midwife who was practicing in the 60s when uh, she and a group of other people established a commune in Tennessee, the state of Tennessee, that <clears throat> was uh, called the farm. They called it the farm. Yep, and it still exists. It does. And they still deliver babies there. Actually, you can pay to um, stay in a cabin on the farm and um, deliver your baby there those midwives are trained in breech birth, by the way. So that's a, um, you know, if that's something that if you're one of those women that like, you know, your baby's not spinning and whatever, that, that is an option for, for breech birth, but yeah, maybe some kind of retreat. Um, because like, I know, like if it were me and I was, you know, couldn't find a midwife and was far away, I would either choose to go to a place like the farm um, and I think they want you to like show up there when you're like 36 or 37 weeks and then you stay and you, you know, you bring your partner, you bring your children, um, and you know, everyone can stay in the cabin and, and then the midwives will help you when, you know, when it's time for you to give birth. Um, or I, another option would be, yeah, having an unassisted birth is maybe a, another option for those women. And in that case, I would just say, you know, make sure to educate yourself. Um, I think Rhea, you said that you, um, used the midwives for like prenatals, but then you just ended up giving birth without them that, I mean, that might be a, a viable option. Yeah. She said, okay. Um, you know, that, that might've been, if, yeah, I'm not sure what I would do in that situation. I probably would end up doing a lot what you did, you know, like have the midwives to give you a little prenatal information. What's the baby's positioning, good heartbeat, you know, and then, um, and then just do it on your own. So. Wow. Um, very interesting little synchronicity here in the comments. Maureen says, my sister Paramatma met her husband on the farm. And Ida May was her midwife. She was so sad that she ended up being uh, the one percent having uh, a C-section. She had two other home births, though. But that's very interesting. Oh yeah, um, very cool. Yeah, and uh, sorry, I'm sorry about that outcome. That's you know some some things happen. Yeah, um, and I wanted to add just because I actually have experience with birth centers. I'm a, I'm a web designer, uh, you know, as as the day job, and I. Um, did a website for a nonprofit called Birth Center Equity, which has um, BIPOC, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color, women-led birth centers that they fund all over the country. So these are generally for women in the cities who are, you know, unable to give birth at home, but, um, you know, want to have a much more holistic and, and healthy birth experience. So Obviously, we're going towards Anastasia's ideals, but there are some alternatives for people. Or if you know somebody in your life who, you know, like doesn't want to go all the way with home birth. And if you're talking to somebody, um, you know, a birth center could be a better option for them than just a hospital. You know what I mean? If you ever meet someone and they're not going to give birth the Anastasia way, uh, a birth center could be a bit, you know, a step up from that. You know, there's, they have all these midwives there and um, everything like that. Thank you um, for sharing that. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, so I think I had uh, another question here. I just want to scroll back up. Um, never mind. I can't remember. So there's one more question here in the Q and A. And remember, guys, if you're watching and you have any questions for Emily, um, you can submit them in the Q and A section. So Maureen asks, have women following Anastasia's teachings been able to reprogram themselves to give birth in love where their conception was conceived 
in lust or rape? Is there an active teaching of this? Like, it sounds like somebody trying to transmute an experience of, of, you know, carnal desire or it in, you know, not wanting to be a part of it into a loving birth. That's interesting. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I know <clears throat> there is, well, there's a right for a woman giving birth without a husband. So uh, in that's in the books. And we did read if uh, is it in the very last book? I'm not sure about Anastasia's wedding <laughs> that um, and that did happen before the conception of their son that she agreed to be married only to him, even though he didn't ask her yet. <laughs> mm. <laughs> clever, clever little snake. <laughs> no. Yeah, she like create, rewrote some laws of the universe with that right. one. And I, but there are a lot of things that I don't, maybe um, there is benefit to, you know, there is benefit to that happening before conception, um, but maybe it could happen after. Uh, and well, I think, you know, your baby is going to benefit from, you know, especially in, I mean, in the case of rape, like if some of that trauma can be healed um, be, and um, let's see, in the case of conceiving a child out of lust. Um, yeah, I'm not sure she has discussed it um, directly, but we have all the answers. We just, you know, we need to access them. Um, and that's not a question I've given very much thought. I'll keep thinking about it. And if you guys are on the social media platform I'll <laughs> I'll let you know if I if I come up with anything <laughs> yeah got you it's a big question yeah. I, I've got I've got some questions of my own here um so we've been talking a lot about midwives during this this conversation here and it makes me wonder how important is it for a pregnant mother to see a midwife or get checked out during the pregnancy how, how would you um what are your thoughts on that um, I think it's important to have checks. I don't think it has to be a midwife. Uh, I'm going to refer to this book again, Brave New Birth. Um, she has a kind of a how-to part for a self-directed pregnancy, for an unassisted pregnancy. Um, so like you can learn how to feel the positioning of your own baby. You can learn how to check your baby's own heartbeat. Um, and other than that, uh, there are only like if a mother um, feels good, if her baby is moving regularly, and um, if she's, you know, yeah, if she's not like weak or overly fatigued. I mean, that's the main thing is a, a mother's um, state of health and how she feels is going to reflect the health of her pregnancy and her baby. So there are things that women can learn to do on their own and you can even keep track of it. So if you do end up like in a hospital or something, you can give them, you know, <laughs> give them all your <clears throat> tallies and your um, paperwork from your pregnancy saying like, here, I have all this data, you know, thought you might want to see it. <laughs> I mean, they might appreciate the information for one reason or another, but, you know, showing that you were responsible. So it doesn't have to be a midwife, but I do think a woman needs to at least check in with herself and, and know how to do it. She can learn how to do that. Oh, that's yeah. powerful. And honestly, um, as, as much as I'd like to have considered myself educated on these subjects, at least some degree before this conversation, I'd never heard the term unassisted birth. So, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I've never heard the term unassisted also, birth. Uh, free birth is another word women use to describe it. Um, it goes by many names. Free birth and unassisted birth are... Yeah, I never heard free birth either. And so this is fascinating. Like, uh, I'm definitely going to get this book and, and share this with my wife. Um, because I didn't know that you could do things like that. You know, you could check the heart rate of your baby. I mean, it all makes sense, but, um, right. This is, this goes to show the, the incredible job our education system does for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yep. 
And and so this makes me think too, like uh, a a woman who is desiring to give birth to a child. Um, do you? And you know, these are just like my man questions, guy who doesn't know very much. But um, do you consider it important for a woman to know like structural things about her body that may cause uh, complications during birth or like under having a grasp or understanding of pre-existing health conditions, you know, like like before getting into it, you know, um, I know some people are averse to seeing any kind of person who may be able to give them that knowledge like uh, like a you know not necessarily a doctor going anywhere to see anyone some people are like hesitant um so I, I, ho I hope you understand where I'm coming from with that yeah yeah I think yeah I think I know what you mean I think um <clears throat> for me have having an understanding of the basic biology of birth was extremely helpful and um I think what it does is it arms you with a bit of confidence. Like I know exactly um, what the baby is doing. I know that the baby knows what he or she is doing and um, that my body is, is making these things happen in a way that is perfectly designed. Uh, so I think, yeah, knowing the basics of the biology, the structural parts, like, you know, that thing I shared about the pelvic bone, for example, yeah. and about how the birth canal will easily pass a large baby. Sometimes just knowing that it's like, oh, well, now I'm not worried about the baby making it through the birth canal. You know, I know a large baby can go through my birth canal. I know a large baby can pass through my pelvic bone. It's designed that way. Um, so I, yeah, I think it is really helpful to know biology basics of birth. And like, does that, um, is that, is that rule universal for women of all sizes? Like even for like a slim woman with like slimmer hips, does that still apply that? Right. Like, because that, that may be a common misconception. Well, um, so uh, what I understand is the average, that this, so there are some women who would be under this, but average um, uh, pelvic opening for all women is 11 to 13 centimeters. Um, so some women might be under that. Um, a very large baby's head would be no more than 9.5 centimeters in diameter. So um, if you were a extremely small woman, it's just, it, I'm not saying it's impossible because it is maybe a woman has, you know, grown a baby in her body that is too big to pass through the pelvic bone. But my understanding of it is, um, a man contributes to the baby, a hormone that says, grow, 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 grow. And the woman contributes a hormone to the baby that says, slow down, slow down, slow down. <laughs> and, um, and it's designed so that a woman will not grow a baby that's too big for her body to pass. Interesting. So, um, that is my understanding of it. And I mean, if you're a woman who is very, very small, maybe, um, I don't know, maybe you want to uh, do a little extra front loading with that, like have someone, they say there are ways to know how big your pelvic opening is based on like the size of your feet or they're like, you know, weird <laughs> little niches, like ways you can um, estimate the, the size of the pelvic opening. So maybe that's something that a very small woman would want to do, but um, I'm, I'm bigger. I'm, you know, five, eight and, you know, I, so I wasn't worried at all about it. But, you know, maybe a very small woman would be, but I, even a small woman, I wouldn't be worried about it if it was me, but. Um. Right. So like, you know, this is, this is again, from my limited perspective as a guy, um, like, so, you know, I, I've heard that sometimes people say like a woman with slimmer hips, for example, would have a more difficulty carrying or birthing a child, but that doesn't necessarily seem to bear out in practice. 
that I, I don't believe that. I don't think that's true. Gotcha. <clears throat> interesting. I hope, I hope this is interesting to you guys in the chat. I'm trying to get my questions answered here. <laughs> but um, happy to do it. it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so if anybody else has any more questions, I feel like we've gotten to all of them. I hope I didn't miss any that were put into the chat. There's been a lot of exchange happening here in the chat. I don't know if you've caught it here. Um, oh, here and there, yeah, I have. Yeah, this is the most active Zoom chat um oh yeah. i see maureen my friend yep. is tiny 100 pounds no problem giving birth to a 10 pound baby thank you for sharing thank you so much yeah that's that's powerful yeah that's powerful i happen to know a lot of like small women that's why i ask mm -hmm. and i actually i'll add to that so in the past like back in the you know let's say in the 70s um and it, even in the 80s, maybe it started to change more in the 90s when uh, C-sections be started, started to become more common. But women who went past their due dates, due date is a misnomer <laughs> to um, their, you know, the estimated date of delivery, maybe we could call it. Um, women, they were not like coerced into having the baby like, really soon or quickly. My, um, my partner, Joe was, he was born three weeks after his due date. Um, which I told you about how his mom was in a car accident. I think that scared him. You know, he's in the womb. Yeah. I think that spooked him. <laughs> and he, he's, I don't want to go out there. Doesn't want to come out. <laughs> yeah. It's scary out there, but, um, you know, it was no big deal back then. And women did it all the time went, you know, three weeks past their due date. And if you, and I remember like my mom said something to me one time. She's like, yeah, they don't let you go that far past your due date anymore, which notice the wording there. They don't let you as if it's not your pregnancy. Um, but, uh, and I said, why not? And she said, uh, well, because the babies uh, get too big. I was like, they didn't get too big 40 years ago, <laughs> but now they get too big, you know? Um, so it's, there's a little bit of like mental gymnastics going on there. It's like, well, women used to do it all the time. And, um, you know, the babies were alive, the infant and maternal mortality was lower than it is now. In infant and maternal mortality mm -hmm. has continued to go up in the U S um, since the increase in, because of increase in C-sections. And so, Oh, and wow. another note about C-sections. This was something I was going to mention when you were talking about the, you know, the difficulty breastfeeding and stuff. Um, if you give a C-section to an animal, um, that animal does not recognize that as their child. There's no recognition that that's their baby. So imagine, you know, because the all of the hormones and the, the things that are supposed to happen in a mother um, to make her a mother didn't happen. And we've come a long way from that. And I, you know, I know women who have had C-sections and a lot of times um, what I've read will happen is, you know, they don't love their child at first, but lo the love does come later. So I don't want anyone to, this is not supposed to be doom and gloom, um, you know, sometimes we learn to love the way our children come to us and um e even when it is not ideal but you know yeah c-sections have been so detrimental to to bonding and um you know to the breastfeeding and just the strength of families yeah oh and postpartum depression for sure thank you linda that's right Wow. And, and, and it's funny how postpartum depression is basically this normalized, almost accepted fact of life when it comes to, you know, pregnancy and birthing children. Mm -hmm. um, they're all just like, yeah, you know, it's going to happen, expected. Um, yeah. and, and so Lauren commented regarding due dates. She says, due dates are calculated from a standard formula based on the first day of your last period. They are not calculated based on conception because most women don't know. So they are actually one or two weeks off from the very start. Yeah, very. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. And that's... and in the past, uh, due date, they didn't ha use a specific day. 
they gave you kind of a window, like your baby's going to be born uh, in mid-December before Christmas. You know, like they, just a kind of a general like window of time when the baby might come. And now there's so much, um, so much emphasis put on this day that um, it has no real significance. And like you said uh, in the in the chat, it's it it had not even based on the conception of the child. Um, so uh, yeah. Wow. 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 And, and so it still generally sticks to nine months. It's just not anywhere close to this alleged due date that, that they would love to, you know, assert. Mm -hmm. And well, what it is, is it's a way to um, coerce women to be, get labor induced. That's, that's the mechanism, you know, that's the function of the due date now is that they can use it as an excuse to get women to um, take drugs to induce labor at the hospital. So. Wow. Wow. Look at us. Re I'm so glad this conversation is happening because we're reclaiming this most sacred and important subject, you know, and freeing ourselves from the shackles of technocracy and returning to the garden and, and happiness and joy. And so you know, it's, this is such a, I don't know, this topic frees the world. You know what I mean? We free our births and, and we literally free mankind, you know? Um, and so what we're talking about here is really revolutionary. And, um, you know, I'm just, I feel compelled to say that. Um, one last question, <clears throat> Evelyn asks here, she says, is it known what is, what is it about the hospital setting that leads to postpartum depression? Well, there, there are a lot of factors. So um, part of it is uh, a lot of times a woman will feel sad. She didn't get the birth she wanted. I, I mean, that's a big part of it. I know a woman who, uh, she had a birth that ended in a C-section at, at a hospital. She later successfully gave birth at home, but she said she had this, um, really a traumatic experience at the hospital. And um, it felt like nobody was there for her. Um, and because later after she gave birth at home, her friends were all like, you're my hero. You're, you know, you, you're so brave, you're so courageous. And she asked the question, where were they when I had this traumatic experience and I really needed their support? Um, so, you know, a lot of times just, the trauma in general um, of will, uh, you know, cause women to, to feel depressed. Um, so there's that. Um, there's also the fact that, um, you know, a lot of women are having trouble breastfeeding. Um, and when you breastfeed, the release of oxytocin that is uh, strengthening your bond to your baby. Um, you know, so if, if you're not breastfeeding, then you're not getting the oxytocin release and um, the that oxytocin might have been interfered with in the first place because of interventions in the hospital. So of course, like you have this baby that needs you for so much. And, um, and if you don't feel bonded to that baby, it's, I mean, it is, a, I mean, that would be devastating, you know, for a new mother. And um, not only that, but she tends to be somewhat isolated after the birth um, in, you know, there are traditional cultures that um, the, you know, mother or mother-in-law will stay with the mother while she takes care of her baby. But a lot of times we have this backwards model that, um, you know, women want companionship before birth and after birth, and they want privacy during birth. <laughs> and then we flip that on its head with the medical model, we isolate them after birth and put everyone and their brother in the birthing room with them. So, um, so that has a lot to do with it. And uh, also, well, I know postpartum depression often sets in around uh, six weeks after the baby comes. Sometimes it's right after, you know, it comes at different times, but um, that coincides with a lot of women returning to work <laughs> after the baby is born. Um, especially if, you know, if she's breastfeeding, then, um, you know, she leaves her baby to go to work, even if she's using a breast pump, uh, a lot of times it doesn't keep her supply up as well as being there with her baby. 
Um, and, you know, and just being separated from her baby is going to be um, uh, I, I don't want to use the word traumatic again, dis distressing, distressing for the mother. And um, so I think all of those have have to do with it. And Megan in the comments here, she says, oh, my, it's so hard without a community. I had postpartum because I lack support after my first birth. Our community can be there for each other. Such a gift. Yeah, it is a gift. Yeah, it's it's really important to to have that community. Yeah, to to find, you know, we found our people, so let's use it. <laughs> yeah. Lauren asks a very beautiful question here. She she's asking, would love to reach out for perspective or solidarity or solidarity for us women who are waiting to manifest their space of love to conceive and birth. It can be hard waiting, especially for those of us in our thirties or later. Yeah. 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 I mean, as much as we can do to set up that kind of, I'm going to pull myself back on video here. Um, as much as we can do to set up that kind of community, if anybody wants to create that, um, I'm happy to support and promote that um, because I'm in the same situation myself. My wife and I have been together for four years already and we haven't even gotten our piece of land, you know, and so we're waiting too. And um, there's, I, I definitely sense that there's a lot happening on, on that end. Um, so I don't know, Emily, if you have any thoughts on that, but I'm, I'm in all support of that and if there's anything we can do in capacity of the foundation just please let me know and we can be of service well i do want to say don't give up on that dream just because of age you know i think we do need to focus on action and i well i remember the the russian woman in one of the books who ended up marrying uh some kind of British diplomat or you know she said she was English gonna... lord yeah the English lord that's right <laughs> um, uh. because she was taking concrete steps all the time to to make that happen right and I know you know I'm living my you know sometimes you get caught up in just the things that you're busy with that it's sometimes it's hard to to devote time to to those like dreams that seem like they're so far away but they get closer every time we take concrete steps to make them happen so don't give up on it and also remember that um there was a therapist in one of the books his uh i think he was like a sex therapist and his wife he, he told his wife that he wanted a son and she was like but i'm too old i think she was like 40 and um you know but you know, it had been voiced and then it turned out it, you know, it ended up that they co-created a child with intention and, um, and they were working on setting up a kin's domain. And she said, uh, well, was reported to have said that she thought she could still yet have another child even after that. And, um, you know, I firmly believe that if, uh, we take care of our bodies, especially in, the you know the ways that Anastasia said you know taking care of our making a space of love and being connected to the earth and I think that our uh, childbearing years can be greatly extended really I do um and uh that's actually a super interesting topic to me if you don't mind a couple more minutes um, I can do a couple minutes yeah okay um just a couple minutes because I, I know that there's this common conception that past the age of 40 becomes, um, like you know, high risk kind of. Yes. Yeah. And I don't believe that at all, because they're saying a high risk in the context of a woman living a modern life in modern settings, That's eating right. the standard American diet That's right. and, and all these things. And where does all that come from? And um, or, you know, there's some concern about the age of the eggs of, of the woman. For example, again, I'm not, um, I'm not, I don't even know if that's a real thing. I might be completely wrong. <laughs> I don't know what I've been deceived yeah, of at this point. I know it's so hard to sort out fact from fiction. Sometimes it's like, well, this is what I've been told, but 
gosh, I don't even know what is true. Yeah. I don't know. Do eggs really get like, is that even a thing? I don't even know. Um, and so why, why I, why I bring this up is because, you know, from Anastasia's perspective, um, and just from my perspective, I, I, I believe too, that a, a woman's, you know, child bearing years could be greatly extended, but like to, to what degree, like is, is a, does age, I imagine probably becomes an issue in your seventies or something, or, or who knows, it, it, even, even in the state of your health, um, how you are in your seventies. Right. But, um, like the Bible talks about women giving That's birth in thinking. old age. Yeah. Like, like many times. Um, and so it's, you know, I don't know. I just, I, I would love some more, a whole more holistic perspective on this idea. Yeah. And, uh, like Ray just said, I, I think it's likely that, yeah, menopause is likely the end to a woman's fertility. Um, but yeah, I mean, can we, uh, ward off menopause for several years I mean I I don't know why not is kind of what I'm thinking it's and you know what I've this is just um not based in any real science this is just kind of a theory but it seems like if you are dying <laughs> faster you maybe like want to like your body tries to have more babies sooner, like a, like a survival of the species type thing. Um, that's been observed in animals, you know, like, so if you are in really good health, you know, if the eggs is a thing, like maybe instead of, maybe your eggs really slower, or, I, or you, you know, because supposedly you have all the eggs, like you're born with all the eggs you will you're ever You're born have. with them. That's the story. I yeah. don't even know if it's true. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. But um, I'm, yeah, I I think those could be extended. And, you know, I, I had my son before I read the series, like I said, which, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I'm almost grateful for that because if I had waited, then I wouldn't have him <laughs> right yeah, now. Right. And he's added so much to my life and I, he gives us so much direction, you know, what we, what we want for our future. Um, so yeah, I, um, you know, we're not in our, uh, paradise home kin's domain yet, but we did build a space of love here where we live. Right. You know, so um, if you are feeling the call to to give, you know, carry a child and give birth now, create a space of love where you are and um, and co-create. <laughs> certainly, certainly, yeah. certainly. You know, Anastasia in the series doesn't only talk about the lives of people on Ken's domain, she does mention, for example, cities like Novo Sibiris uh, being planted with cedars throughout the entire city and becoming a holy temple of the universe. Right. And, yeah. and she doesn't forsake the lives of the people in the cities. And if she goes through such detail to describe the future of the cities or the, you know, a, a city like that, then she's also saying that those people will have children and those right. people will those people will live out their lives in the city. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so I don't have all the answers on that, but it's, it's definitely a thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I want to be respectful of everyone's time here. Um, and Emily, your incredible sharing and, and knowledge that you have given to this community here in this event. Um, this is the most active zoom chat I've ever seen. I almost feel oh, guilty good. for having, for having to, for having to end this. Um, <laughs> but if you guys want, we can create maybe a group on, on Telegram or uh, a, a better, or I don't know if one exists on the community platform already. Um, but as much as we can do to facilitate the, you know, continuance of this discussion, I'd like to do. 
Um, the meeting chat will be saved. Um, I will be sharing the document that Emily shared with everyone, the resources again. Um, and yeah, I, I, I would like everyone in the, in the, in the chat to uh, clap it up for Emily one more time. Um, thank you so much for thank, everything thank that you- Thank you so much. This was so fun. This is what I love. This, <laughs> this, I, birth, so. I can tell. I mean, you're amazing. Um, thank you for what you're doing here. So grateful for your sharing, uh, for the lives that this will impact. You know, imagine uh, somebody will hear this. They will give birth in a happy, you know, unassisted way. And that is an impact that's felt eternally. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, it is. Yeah. And, and so you're, you're touching lives in a, in a very significant way here. And uh, thank you for, for what you're doing. And thank you for bringing this to our community. Thank you to our amazing audience members. So many of you are our faces who I, I know very well. So it's very nice to see you. Um, thank you for being a part of this. This will be on YouTube um, for you to watch in its, its, its entirety. If anyone would like to do the incredible service, it would be a great help if we could have this video time stamped. If anyone would even be able to help with that in a basic way um, to just get some basic timestamps because there's so much content here, that would be huge. Please contact me. Um, I would love you forever. Um, and and when, when I get the new books printed, I'll send you some books or something. You know what I mean? I'll, I, I want to take care of you. Um, but anyway, my friends, um, have, have a, oh, look at this. I got to share this comment. Risha says, you've birthed new ideas within me tonight, Emily. Thanks all. Um, and so thank you all, my friends. Thank you again, Emily. Um, thank you. Much love to, to this whole community. Have a blessed and joyful night, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Maureen, contact me. Um, I will give you my email, or if you don't have me on Telegram already, um, here is my email. That would be such a great help um, if you want to get in touch. All right, everybody. Take care, my friends. Yep, Maureen, just contact me. I appreciate it very much. Um, or you can find me on the website, but got to end the meeting. See you later.